Um, okay, so. Oh, and Paige, if I can just say that Gabby and Diana held down the fort and did an incredible job. That is true. Yes, I should say did. that they were <laughs> tremendous. I came back. I mean, I feel like I didn't even need to come back, honestly. So, you know. Don't hit it. <laughs> Well, no, they don't agree with you. <laughs> I do appreciate, appreciate it. all yeah, the hard work, everybody. <laughs> picked up my slack. So I'm going to try to whip through this because we have, uh, we want to get through the marijuana thing before the public hearing. So um, with respect to our, remember our zoning articles, uh, there was a snafu on advertising. So those, we did hear back from the AG, and fortunately um, they have said that as long as we run notification in the newspaper starting today um, to give 21 days comment sort of so if anybody objects um, and if no one objects then they'll go ahead and review them and ratify them but they will remain on the the warrant I believe till we know for sure because we want to make sure that if we need to um, re-adopt them we would do that at the Springtown meeting but we will not if not necessary so what would be the status then of the assisted uh, not the assisted living, but uh, that's that's not happening. So th that's th not going to happen. Yeah, I did watch the last meeting, and I saw there was some confusion. There was never any intention on anybody's part over here that the accessory apartment um, would be reconsidered. Um, you know, I don't. Barney and Lorraine, I think, had their own initiative, and that's fine. And that was what they intended to do. I think they thought an a placeholder had been put on. Unfortunately, they got the, the placeholder was mistakenly put on with all of the 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 um, Warren articles. Um, thinking. But it is on. Well, no, that one doesn't need to be ratified or re-ratified because right. the AG no, does I not review right. denials. So they only review approvals. So the, basically the bottom line is there is no accessory apartment bylaw on this warrant. There will not be. So and that, was, that was never the plan unless there was a new proposal that someone else would bring it up. The staff and uh, the board was never taking that on again. So for now, you know, I mean, I don't know. I shouldn't say never, but it's kind of how I feel. Um, <coughs> Walnut Street Affordable Housing Project. Um, Gabby and I had a meeting this afternoon and it remains on track. In fact, um, the FHA is, we're hoping that they might even make a selection on March 17th, a week from today. They've been, they've gone through and scored the two developers and um, they're checking references right now and then they're going to have a meeting and discuss that and then um, there's a, po a chance it could be decided on the 17th, um, which is right on our, our preliminary schedule we had. So that's good. Um, with respect to Uptown, I did email Sam Schofield the other day to ask how, because I had heard a rumor that someone had said that it was going to be December before Shovel Town opened. June. Yeah, um, and he wrote back and said he, they were hoping for June pending no equipment delays, which you know there will be equipment delays, so, but um, I did not want to hear December, so. Just, just one quick thing on that. Uh, yep. Have we, do we know yet um, in what capacity? And I'm, I'm kind of thinking about, you know, what would be available for parking at that point, probably nothing on site, I would guess. Well, yeah, as long as they don't have residential nothing open, on site anyways, they though. don't need to provide the on site parking yet. Once those four units at the top of the um, fire station open, and I don't know if they're on the same track, but if right. those four units open, they must have at least four parking spaces on site. Residential has to have, but a commercial, you're right, they could get away with using the area parking mm -hmm. and this is not on my report but that's something we're looking at um, we got a quote from Park Corporation <coughs> to do a, a parking plan just because we kind of want to get ahead of this unfortunately the quote was you know so thorough that it was very high so we um, we've been talking to DPW and we're gonna do our own sort of little one we're thinking of things like we don't want the residents to get upset over there when this you know when the shovel towns open and there's a a theater event going on so we want to try to figure out how to manage that and when we have residents Agreed. there we don't want them parked for you know overnight if they did want to go on the street parking so we want to try to navigate right. some of this before there's a problem and then we always have to adjust but we and, want to and my only point on that and the reason I brought it up is just because especially when there's still big construction going to be going on there at that time you know we don't want that coming back and biting us right right so they might decide I don't know I haven't talked to them obviously but they might decide to hold off on the residential until at least they get the funeral home stuff going well enough that they're not spreading into that parking lot because they need to provide those four spaces right but that's only four space I'm just saying that when they have that open for commercial purposes unless yep. it's open in a limited capacity in some way and even then it's going to be a little bit of a free-for-all I would think so, so has there been any conversation about if there is an equipment delay or other construction delays, 
whether they'll come back and try to do the pop up again this summer. Um, and I've heard no mention of that. And well, based they, on they what I heard about last year, they work this week, <coughs> taking taking everything out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. They, I don't think they made. That money was not, of, that I think with the rain possible. last year, every weekend, I, I think yeah. they pulled out early, if you recall. Yeah. So I think I have not heard anything about okay. that. So um, our tourism website that I've talked about, it's actually launched. So um, if you go to foxboroughplainvillerentham.com <coughs> or visit fpw.com, um, you'll see a pretty cool website. It's a soft launch right now, but we do have a marketing consultant right, paid for through the Mass Gaming Commission who is getting ready to basically hard launch it and start doing all the things you do to sell this region. So it'll be kind of cool. So that's exciting. I've been working on this for a couple of years, <coughs> so we actually have a real website now. Check it out. Um, MBTA Community and Housing Choice. So um, I'm going to be presenting this at the April 2nd, April 12th, sorry, um, Board of Selectmen meeting. And it's actually a requirement that the Board of Select, be, that there be this presentation on this um, initiative to the selectmen. And then we have to actually file out a form and it has to be filed by May 2nd. And that would, there's a couple other steps that are on the second page of the report that, um, that would keep us in interim compliance. And then they expect, they want you to adopt the zoning um, sometime December 2024. Um, so I would stress that it's important we stay in interim compliance while we're pursuing mass work grants and whatnot. Um, we'll see what happens in 2024, but for right now, um, we want to stay in compliance so that we can try to get that signal at Walnut Street. Um, and that's all I have. Oh, and then, um, what did I remember to say? We did, no one knows this yet, really, um, but we did just get the site approval letter for uh, 119 Moore Street from the state. So that will start now. It's eligible to be filed with the zoning board. So, but according to Bill Buckley, there's a couple months of engineering to be done before that'll happen. So, but that letter just came out this afternoon, late. So, it did get approved by the state. And that, what that just means is that they're free to move forward. It doesn't mean it's approved, approved is the wrong word. It's just an eligible site for them to apply to the zoning board for consideration. <coughs> so, <coughs> FYI. That's all I have. Okay. Very good. Um, I think I'm going to wrap up in it being sometime after 7.05 p.m., we need to discuss the proposed marijuana establishment bylaw for town meeting articles. Um, so, one thing will be Yeah. Right. So, um, as you are aware, because I watched a couple of your meetings, um, there was a bylaw drafted just initially by Pat Costello. Um, and so, since Monday, I've had a chance to work on it. I met with Leah somewhere here. Um, over there, and um, actually Jeff was able to stop by, and then Barney, so we had a little powwow that just was impromptu, really helpful. Um, I've revised the bylaw, and Barney has as well. Um, I'm not saying it's 100%, but it's, you know, a little, I think a little bit closer to what we wanted. Um, and the main thing I would ask of you guys is, um, and I emailed you about this, is that on page four, is a list of the special permit requirements. And then after I had already finalized this and sent it out, I noticed that Littleton, the town of Littleton, had some other lists. So on this separate handout, I actually could make it easier. On the second handout about marijuana, I have all the same conditions that are on page four. And then below that are some of the Littleton conditions, uh, not conditions, requirements. And you'll see there are a lot more. So I just thought, um, in addition to whatever discussion we have, that we could maybe go through those. And then it, uh, Barney thought it most appropriate that this board sort of decide on that since you own the special permit. So it would be like, what do you want to see in the special permit? Um, so that might be a good thing for you to give input on. What happened to the section that, um, that said no, yes, special permit? Right. So we took that out because we came up with a different approach, and this is by no means anywhere done. And in fact, it's not even right, because um, the red is a red herring. It doesn't, that just shows R15, which is, I think, confusing to everybody. Um, sorry, let me get near the microphone. So, um, but this is, these yellow colors here, the yellow here and here, are right now what we're talking about for areas. So then we don't have to do it in the use table, because it was really hard to explain, like, it could be in the general industrial, but not within 5,280 feet of the town common, as measured by the coral flats. Like, it was cumbersome to try to explain it. So all of a sudden, we were like, what about an overlay map? And then that way, you could just make a picture. Mm -hmm. So it, so is the yellow by your right hand, Route 1? The 
the yes. yellow by my right hand? Yes. yes. All of S1, all of up here by root one, yes. And what's down there? Where's and that? None of this. Yeah. And then this yellow. What is that? It's like Springbrook area, Belcher. Oh, okay. Belcher. And then which one is this? This is, I think, Forbes Crossing area. Gotcha. It, it's the park. So yeah. Those areas. So those are the current ones we're discussing. Again, no one's really made any decisions, <coughs> but um, so that's why we got rid of the SP and all that, because it was just too confusing to try to explain where it could be allowed and where it couldn't be allowed, because it wasn't as neat and clean as to allow it in like all of general industrial, because some of those areas are close to uptown and we didn't want that. We definitely don't want anything uptown um, on that. So and, and so based on that map, overlay map, is everything by right? Is everything special permit? No, everything's special permit. Okay, that's what I thought. No by right. Yeah, okay. And then, like, I would recommend, this is a little further in advance, and we kind of need to regroup. The selectmen are going to be talking about this Monday, uh, Tuesday, I believe, right, Leah? Yeah. Um, they, and so if any of you all want to attend that meeting virtually or whatnot, we could post it if you think there's any benefit to that. But that said, and maybe we should do that just in case, but um, I forgot. Oh, we were talking. The other thing that Littleton did was kind of cool is we believe we only have one retail establishment that would be allowed in one cultivation, although that we need to confirm that, but that's what I'm being told has been discovered. Um, in that case, we might want to do something like an RFI where you put it out to bid and say, kind of send us your highest and best offers. Um, so, so that's based on but the that fact that we have X amount of uh, alcohol serving establishments or, or I think liquor, it's cool. liquor stores? We think it's all alcohol. All yeah. yeah, we have to vary. That's one of the things right. we have to check. So that would limit us to the one right now. If it increased at some point in the future, they might be allowed a second. Yeah, and I believe town meeting can vote to increase it. But for right <clears> now, we're just assuming the one is accurate, and we're going to double check that. Um, I think we're all comfortable with one for right now, and just kind of see how it goes, and then decide from there. Um, so that's kind of where we are. So I don't know if you all, how you want to go through this. Did, has anybody had a chance to review this? No. no. Um, You're talking about the little, Littleton list? Yeah, the Littleton list yeah. or the general one in, in general. Um, Before we get too deeply into discussion on this, I would like to disclose that if this does move forward, I would be an interested party in attaining a cultivation license. Just I want to have that out there for the record. And I do feel that I can be impartial in the voting. So, <clears throat> you know, I don't know if we want to go through the section by section right now, unless unless you think that that's what we really need to do, Paige, to be. Well, I want to get to a point where you feel comfortable for the selectmen to discuss it Tuesday night right. and maybe you know vote to put it on the warrant. So I, I think we need to have enough of a discussion right. that this board feels at least. 75% good about it. You know, we might need to tweak it a bit, but I mean, we want Barney to come back and really look at it and maybe, town council one more time. Maybe for this purposes of this discussion, it would be more helpful if um, you could just quickly go through and sure. point out any departures from the original. Well, that'll be hard to do. But it, I'll try. I mean, I can go through the. How about yeah, I just so go through the bylaw and then we can. That's, talk that's about what it. I meant. You yeah. probably know the original better than I do, yeah. <laughs> so you let me know. All right. Um, but so <coughs> that, obviously the first one is basically to rescind the rescission. That would be the first step. That number one there, article. If that fails, then this is all moot. So yeah. that would it would not move forward if that fails <clears throat> to move forward. Assuming that the rescission, the not allowing marijuana. Um, is rescinded, then we would go on to this next article, which would be to allow marijuana establishments and retailers. So um, the first section, nobody's really had any problems with. It's just a purpose. Um, and then the definitions, this is one, a change from their first version, is that rather than having the definitions in the definition section, Barney recommended we move them to this section just because they only pertain to this section. So it's kind of more helpful to have them. It's not like you talk, you talk about anything else anywhere else. So it's kind of helpful to have it all in that section. So we added a local licensing authority. And that's one um, change as well. Um, Jeff, you had mentioned that you might yeah. want consideration to be given to not necessarily having the selectmen automatically be the local licensing authority um, to deal with the host committee agreement and whatnot. They thought maybe an ad hoc committee. 
So we did check with town council on that. He just wrote a long letter about that. Seems like it can be done. Right. Um, I didn't have a chance. I was reading it on my phone, so I didn't read it. But it seemed like something could be done. So that might be something that the selectmen will talk about. And um, Jeff, I don't know if you're going to be around on Tuesday. To maybe, I mean, it might be good for these two boards, if possible, to kind of put their heads together, since our right. time is short on this. But, um, so that's one. And we defined host community agreement. That's a new one, just so that folks know what it is. Marijuana, that's not new. And the other three were already in there. They're just now in this section. Applicability, we really just changed format on this, um, you know, to, to make it match our bylaw. Eligible locations did change um, because now we, um, we actually referenced the map. And this is something Barney maybe hasn't reviewed, so I do want, you know, I kind of whip this up. So hopefully it passes muster, but I think it will. Um, and then now we get into the 7.65, and this is really, um, you know, some of the meat of it. So we, um, it can't be located within 500 feet of park, school, whatever. That's all state law. Um, we did have it at 1,000, but then when we looked at it, we're not sure we're allowed to do that. So um, Barney had had it at 1,000. Um, and let's see. But if, if uh, Attorney Costello or someone from the state says we could, would that be the preference to, to limit it to a higher number rather than 500? I don't know. That's what um, I think Barney had put it. So I don't know. what, what do, Is that your, it's really more your preference or the town's preference? I wonder if he chose that because I don't know. Well, I don't have a selection field on it as well. So. We haven't spoken about that yet. Right. I just want to see if the medical, mar I'm wondering if the medical marijuana might say that. I won't look now because it'll take too much time, but that, I'm just wondering if that's where he got the thousand okay. from. Okay. Um, yeah, he's going to look. So it can't be in a building containing residential units, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it has to be in a building. <laughs> it can't be, you know, a pop up. Um, the language in number four, um, we were questioning, you know, the size there, but I did, will say that is taken also from our medical marijuana. No, so that number four already exists in med medical marijuana where it says you can't have a gross floor area of less than 25 heat feet or greater than 20,000. Um, that's a retailer. We don't anticipate 20,000, but I don't know. Um, we added in the marijuana retail facility shall have restrooms, and that was based on meeting that um, staff had had. Is that what it says? Yeah, 1,000. Yeah, yes. So that's where Barney got the 1,000, trying to be consistent. So. Okay. Um, We'll, we'll verify that we can't do that, but um, one, so the restrooms, so that was something that Brookline, we did, uh, well not we, but some people from the town, the uh, town manager, police chief, all met with the Brookline Police Department because they were one of the first to open mar uh, recreational marijuana and got a lot of great tips. And so one of the things, which I actually think will be not really as important now, but back in the day when there were lines waiting in to get into the marijuana stores, people would come from far and need a restroom. And they couldn't use a restroom. So that was becoming a nuisance, especially in Brookline, where they don't have right. as much space. Um, but So we did just add in there that it has restaurants available to customers. So then that way, I don't know, okay. so people won't be using the bushes, I guess. Um, hours of operation has changed. If you recall, there was a strict time in the first draft. We made right. that so it's set by a host community agreement. That's usually something um, that you know is, is negotiated. And in fact, the police chief in our meeting on Monday, Kevin, was that Monday or Tuesday? Monday. When we met. Yeah. yeah. Um, he was saying, like, for example, if um, a retailer opened at the stadium. Um, just saying that, like in Patriot Place, like he wouldn't want them to close at 8 p.m. when every other store was open or every other thing was open till 10. So he's kind of saying, you know, you don't necessarily want to have like a blanket thing. There might be case by case, you know, where it makes more sense to have them open later. Well, um, I certainly do like the idea of specifically linking with language the HCA to the special permit. Yeah. I think that's a good idea. And one of the things we discussed with Chief Grace also was just a question about how alcohol. Um, establishment how late they're staying open. He said they often have hours till 10, but often close earlier than that if they're not seeing traffic. But they'd be allowed to open till 10. That's what I'm saying. So I think it'd be case by you know different, yep. you know, depending on the circumstance. The um, host committee, host community agreement would do it, and um, or you guys could if if that wasn't done. So you can't smoke on the property. Um, signage has to be compliant with town of Foxborough sign bylaw. 
and you can't have like big pot leaves and neon, you know, stuff yeah. there. It has to be very discreet. Um, and then that they must provide Foxborough Police Department, Building Commissioner, and Planning Board names, phone numbers, email of all management staff and key holders. So that's kind of standard stuff. And then this 766 is the special permit requirements. So this is kind of what you would be asking for. And this is what the extra handout is about. Um, and so just looking at that, you know, obviously it's, some of this is no brainer. Name, address of the owner, evidence of the applicant's right to occupy um, the site, either through a deed or a lease or a letter of intent, something like that. Um, you have to have a statement and a vote about shareholders, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of standard stuff. Certified list of all parties and in interest. Um, let's see, proposed minimum security measures for the marijuana establishment, including lighting, fencing, alarms to ensure the safety. Copies of all licenses that have been issued to the applicant by the Cannabis Control Commission. I'm not sure they'd have them yet, but maybe, you know, if they were coming back or something. And then for cultivation and growth facilities, and I know, Jeff, you had a little concern about the proposed odor mitigation plan, including indicating locations of odor mitigation equipment. It should be state of the art. So like Jeff was saying, like, what is state of the art? And then I think if you go, let me see, I think I saw, I liked, if you go on page two of the extra handout with the little tin thing, um, I liked what they had under number five there for, instead of this maybe, for cultivators, basically says they have to do energy use reduction and opportunities for renewable energy and strategies to reduce electric <laughs> demand and engagement. So I thought that was a... At least those are objective standards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, although those don't ex necessarily... <coughs> we might still want to keep that unambiguous or that ambiguous language in there because it can work. Like, we use that type of language for... Um, I think I complained about it then, too. You did. Um, <laughs> but maybe we, with this and that, it would be like a little extra because I do think... We want to make sure we, because sometimes they could come and say, well, these more efficient ones are noisier. So we, then we have to balance the, you know, the noise versus the efficiency. So how's, how's that different than, than, you know, language we use with like engineers, for example, for best practices? You know, and, and you know, it doesn't say it has to be the most modern, latest, up-to-date thing, but they have to be able to prove that the quality of how they do it, mm -hmm. how they design it, and how it's, and how it's installed. Um, Works works correctly, so I'm not saying that that language is right, but I'm just saying. No, I like the term. I'm writing that down because I like the term best practices. That's a good. I think we found a way to add that in there. Okay. And maybe I'm trying to think if on for Doug King's project, I'm trying to remember. That's I think one of the ones we used it, it on. It was over here. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, we looked it up. Oh, you did. And yes. did it say state of the art or? Did Unfortunately, it, it didn't it say. Did. That. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Darn. It well, maybe we could come up with something a little better than that. But I think the intent is there, and we all kind of know what it is. Um, can, could we require proof of um, insurance coverage? Is that within our purview? I think we could. I mean, I, the thing of it is, is I don't know if they would have insurance coverage at the time of application. It might be that that's more of a condition. I mean, obviously they're going to need. So like, would, it would be a, have to be a licensing condition. It yeah, be a, licensing be a licensing condition. condition. So I think that goes without saying. But I think this is more like application. Okay. Stuff. So I don't think, would you tell me, would they have insurance if they like just had a purchase and sale on the property and nothing else? They wouldn't. Yeah. No. So that would be something we would do at the time of review. And, okay. And I, I just want to make sure we do capture that. that. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the, what's in the original draft. So then let's go through the Littleton stuff and just see if any of these jump out. Um, number one kind of confused me only because... Right. I defer to Jeff on this one because he's the expert right now. I've, I've not, you know, like I told everybody, once Foxborough, like, banned marijuana, I stopped reading every planning document on the marijuana. So now, and then I've been out for seven weeks and I can't read very well anyway due to the brain stuff. So I haven't been able to read all the state marijuana requirements. So I'm like, would they have a host committee agreement when they were filing with us? Well, even know. even number two here. Talks of, it, it gets to that same sequencing issue. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, number one presupposes that the first order of business would be to negotiate the HCA. <clears throat> nothing happens before that. Certainly, nothing can happen before that. They, the license cannot be issued until that's completed. Hey. But it, 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 I'm not sure if that's the best sequencing, but it certainly forces a, an order yeah. of, you know, process. That might be a good way, because now I, I stand corrected, because I just looked at the one from Maynard, that list that we looked yeah. at, um, which is kind of long, but um, that does have the marijuana, I mean, it has the host community agreement. 
as first. finished yep. before, and only then can they go to the board of selectmen. So that might be wise. That might be the way to go. Is like negotiate all that and then come to us. But I don't know. We might right. have to think about right. that. Right. No. I, yeah. um, or not the select whoever is doing it. Right. Sorry, I said no, selectmen. But I agree the whole thing. Um, in place. It, it's only fair to the community. But host it. The host agreement should be in place before anything moves forward. Right. So, so do we want to put one in there? I think so, yes. Okay. That's the only thing that would be fair to the town. Yeah. And I think, too, as well, just because we'd like to know the status of whatever they're doing. I don't think there's any harm in two. That's just And so where would this be going under 766? Yeah, this would be okay. somehow incorporated. I have to meld it with the existing ones. You know, some of them are going to be overlapping. So if, but, so if that's the case, I'll have to meld them. Otherwise, I'll just <coughs> add it in. Um, then three, a list of waivers um, the applicant seeks to obtain from the Cannabis Control Commission. I, so, yeah, I think that's interesting. I had never seen anything about yeah. well, and I think the ability we to want apply to know that, right? for waivers, yes. Copies of all policies and procedure, procedures approved by the Cannabis Control Commission, um, including operating safety procedures. So no harm in that, right? I mean, it, I yeah. there may be some redundancy there yeah. uh, within our existing draft text, but yeah. we, we can yeah, we can finish that. that. Yeah, and then um, the, for the cultivation, I think we do want to add that in about the sort of energy efficiencies. I think that's smart to put that in there. And then the quantity and source or sources of all marijuana and marijuana products that will be sold. That seems to make sense. I mean, I don't know if they know, but they could certainly have a goal. Jeff, what's your face about? Um, I'm just saying, <laughs> I think, that, again, I do think that that is... And, you know, Kev, obviously, when, when we had spoken a couple of weeks ago, or even previously, you know, I, I still didn't exactly understand, you know, what was part of licensing, what wasn't part right. of licensing, et cetera. Right. That certainly is going to be, but it's not going to be introduced until a later step. So it could be, as you said, conditioned, you know, um, as a condition going forward. Right. But I'm thinking that if, if we follow what would appear to be the sequence, it probably would not be available information at that time. I mean, it might be generalized. Right. Well, I think they must, I mean, probably like a lot of uses, I'm, I'm imagining the Cannabis Control Commission and the host committee community, you know, would be like, so how much do you think you're going to do? You know, what is the, you know, so yeah. they probably are going to have some sort of goal. So well, also, this, this is confusing because they're using marijuana establishment in a different way than we are. To us, a marijuana establishment is a grow facility and a marijuana retailer is a retailer. True. Okay, so, so let me, yeah. So, it, and I do think the commission uses some different terminology. So we should, regardless, whether whatever we do, we should, we need to either yeah. be consistent yeah. or, or, or segregated in some other fashion because we're, like, we're looking at two different uses here. Okay. Now, in, you know, in some, in some places, in some states, they allow the retail right on the site of the grow establishment. Uh, that's a possibility. Things, that's do. a possibility yeah, here. here too. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, you know, Sharon I just like, yeah. Well, well I think Sharon on two different sites. Or something? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, they're separated. Yeah, slightly, slightly. But I'm just, I'm just pointing that out. I mean, I don't because they're saying where are you getting the weed from, and we're right. growing it right here. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, that's okay. all I'm. Yeah. Well, and I think I think what you have to remember too is these requirements. I mean, are kind of also. Um, really just application submittal things. So in a way, you know, in the narrative, you're going to want them to say, oh, our marijuana is going to be trucked in from Northampton, and then be like, oh, how many trucks is that going to be? Or is it, oh, it's going to be grown on site. Oh, okay, then you know it's not going to be. And so it kind of gives you information to make your decision. It's not necessarily binding or part of the major application. It's more just part of the narrative, I think, where it will help you I, I understand the scale. I think that's what you're going to hear either. I think they're going to name the specific Manufacturer isn't the right word, but the specific company that's packaging and providing the different types of marijuana for either recreational or medical use. Mm -hmm. And that's what they'll tell you. They're not going to say, we're getting a truck in from Northampton. Right, right. And we're going to do it ourselves. But if you know it's coming from off site, you'd be like, hmm, well, when's it coming? How's it coming? What's right. the truck route? You right. know, then that suddenly that changes it if then it's not off site. So right. it just it basically gives you more information with which to consider impacts and uh, I think it would be helpful. Um, let me just make a note of that. Okay, then the seven is kind of the same. It is Quantity, the same. blah, yeah. blah, blah. A written statement that confirming that no marijuana or marijuana products will be smoked, burned, consumed on the premises. So I think we might want to use that one rather than 
maybe what we have, or maybe we didn't even have it there. We have it somewhere else. I do, you do have it in there. We had it somewhere else. And I, and I did want to just mention for you guys, as a, a little bit of a caveat, there, there are provisions for uh, those types of establishments, light, specific licenses that are not available now, but expect to be available you know, in a pilot program Soon. What specific? For consumption. Social on, consumption. On site on -site. consumption. Yeah. Right. So, under those circumstances, I, this would probably just, it, you'd have to have that specific kind of license. It would not be the type of license right. that we would be considering as part of what would appear to be the first round anyway. It's going to be interesting to see how they do that because you can have a beer and be fine, but they're, they're you know, how are they going to determine how much? marijuana somebody can consume before they're impaired behind there, the wheel. There are limits for those in, in that, pilot. under that pilot license, which is available. You can review the text, and there are specific limits. Now, what, what do they mean? I don't know. But there is specific text about that. Hey, it's under eight there. Yep. You might just add the word vape. Word what? Vape. Okay. Or vaping or whatever because it's different from smoking. Look at you being all hip and known stuff. Okay. So I guess the bottom line is when I look this, I actually prefer Littleton's language and I think I might want to just take out the good stuff of our prior draft and like incorporate it in here. I think a lot of this stuff, like even as we keep I was just reading ahead, you know, the name and owner, that's fine, the articles, corporation, licenses, but like um, I liked thirteen. I like their 13 better than what we had, so I feel like that, that was a good one to put in there with all the site plan requirement, you know, it's basically saying further delineate various areas, indoors and out there, blah, blah, blah. So I feel like that's, that's good. So I think I would recommend we kind of take this one and then make sure we get all the good stuff from the prior list. Yeah, I would just say be judicious, yeah. you know, what you think is appropriate. Um, so that's, that's uh, seven, six, Six, yep, seven, six, six, back to the other one. And then there's some mandatory findings that you would have to make in addition to um, the, set, the tra traditional special permit findings. You would have this one, two, three, and four mm -hmm. um, that would be required in order to grant the special permit in addition to the standard ones. Then there'd be some annual reporting. Um, little bit to us but I like one and two because it basically puts it with the police department and the building department for some of that you know they have to keep them up to date every year and um, have a meeting every year and then the transfer of the permit let me see where this went um, did you have a chance to like review that first right under the 769 that remember we talked about that first sentence there about the special permit running concurrent with the property interest as opposed to the license? Um, or have we not checked that out yet? We didn't. Okay. Yeah. I had just I suggested. I thought we addressed it in the meeting, but maybe not. I had just suggested that I'm not sure whether it would be better or maybe not. Because this, this you know, has it running concurrent with the, either the ownership or lease in, mm -hmm. interest right. in the property yeah. as opposed to the license, which, you know, could be could be revoked or not renewed, uh, which is an annual renewal uh, prior to the expiration of any property interest. But so I think it's just something to they think about. Their lease and they had another location that met all the criteria. They could well, there, there are provisions right. for that as yeah. well yeah. for transferring yeah. to a different but location. But to Jeff's point, I was sort of playing devil's advocate on that only because I think that the state's um, hand in marijuana permitting like if they lose their license they're not running a marijuana operation what regardless of whether the planning board yeah. whatever what we say yes. so i was making the unlikely example which i don't even think this could ever really happen but imagine something lapsed and they couldn't sell for a month again i, I can't imagine that would you know i don't know that we'd want a knee jerk be like oh your permits rescinded and then they could go back and you know reinstate it somehow so i guess i do need, i guess we'll look into that but i yeah. don't really I feel like the state is so heavy in managing this that you know if you're not allowed to sell by the state, you're not a marijuana establishment yeah. or retailer. Period. Yep. You're done. So um, yeah, let me go back to that. Um, I'll check on that. Removal bond. Bar uh, Barney added this. I think this is a new new since last night. Yeah. Quick question. Yep. Why? Um, 
Why would a documentation of a bond posted with the Cannabis Control Commission satisfy this requirement? That is a, a requirement of the license. And yeah, but wouldn't we want another bond? Because they is the Cannabis Control Commission going to give us the money from their bond if we have to remove the Well, let's just at, remove it. Right. Well, I think the I think the primary function of the bond posted to the commission is for the destruction of any inventory. Okay. I think that's the idea. If something happened to your license, um, they would want to destroy your inventory. Now, I'm not sure exactly you know, what rights that gives the business owner, or if any, but, um, but they were also some language that was talking about the property itself. And honestly, it didn't make sense to me because I'm not sure w what the town would want to be doing in terms of a building. You know, we right. certainly wouldn't want to raise the building. No, I mean, well, that's what know. I was just looking at this, reading right. it closely, and I'm like, town must remove the facility. Well, that language was in the original oh, draft was? bylaw. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I thought this was new. Gabby and I yeah. kind of talked about that. Um, yeah, so I don't know about that. Um, but we don't certainly don't want to remove the facility. Right. I think what if we put something like um, the documentation of a bond posted with Cannabis Control Commission may satisfy this com requirement subject to planning board conditions or something like that. So it basically gives leaves you the open. discretion case leaves by case open. as we learn more. Yeah, it leaves it open. Um, okay, and then abandonment, discontinue use. Basically, if they don't do it within a year, this might be new. I don't. I think this got added, but I my, I didn't know the actually. Very the well. number one was in the draft bylaw that if if they don't exercise the special permit within a year. I, actually, I thought it might even have been six months. I'm not sure. But there was a provision, if you don't exercise it, we're pulling it. Right, okay. So going back to the one before about the bond, now that I look at number two under 7611, I feel like that's what would have to be done. That's the removal is, you know, um, shall be required to remove all material, plants, equipment, and other paraphernalia from the permitted premises. I feel like that's what we'd be looking for, not the building. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, there's right. no, so we I agree. Maybe this could some, we could make some reference to that <clears throat> in 710 in 7610 that basically says consistent with like 76112. I'm actually going to look into that a little bit because again, why would we want to why would we want the town to Get require all. that prior to surrendering the state license, which it says in number 1. Right, you know, right. I, I just don't I I'll look into Maybe it. yeah, look into to see if we can just rely on the state to do this because yeah, like exactly. you said, if the state rescinds exactly. or they remove it then that's it, you know, but we do want to make sure they clean up anything. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, Limitations, um, number shall not exceed the number that are allowed um, by state law unless there's a town ballot. Um, this is right now, we, we made the decision the other day to prohibit delivery. Um, and we also, so this is where it talks about consumption, uh, number two under 7612, that all marijuana retailers and establishments are prohibited from delivering cannabis or marijuana products to consumers and from offering cannabis or marijuana products for consumption on the premises. So that kind of, that's that prohibition. And then we did say though, the curbside may be authorized as part of the special permit process. So how does that jive with the fact that the state is allowing delivery, let's say, let's say, there's a delivery service in Brockton, and a medical patient calls well, from Foxborough. How, how do you do so that? So interesting thing was, and there are certainly there licenses are. for delivery yes. services, yes. but I was even thinking about under two. We as this hasn't gone through council yet, have it? No. I think the key there is the med. You know, we may end up with a medical mm -hmm. application. Right. And under those circumstances, you know, there may be some. Well, we have a medical marijuana bylaw, so we actually probably will need to clean that up. Maybe that. Well, I'm thinking specifically in terms of delivery. It, it may be right, something that the state to go. They don't have. They don't have a. Uh, requ you know, uh, mm -hmm. that service would be required. Right. Uh, in yeah. some way, I'm just saying we should check. Okay. Right. Um, and then citing. Let's see what this says. It talks about the map. That's a map. That's it. And then the this, the last part is adopting the map itself. So that's basically where we are. I think it's made some progress. Yeah. Mm. So what do you think? It's a lot better than it was. Yeah, it's a lot better. <laughs> yes. All right. So um, like Still I said, Tuesday night, uh, if you guys have any comments in the interim, let me know. I'm going to try to wrap it up. 
and then you know for the next round we got to get it to council Barney's back Monday you know it'll go through another review but in the meantime the selectmen will be talking about it Tuesday night um, can we make a note to post the planning board just in case we will have town council on Jeff so if there's anything that we want to talk about like that comes up I did ask Pat to attend on Tuesday so it could be good I, it could be I mean it's tough for anyone him included to sit, you know, in real time and try to. Make he seems that. to know it pretty well, though. He does seem he to kind of know it. Now, so. okay. Yeah, I tried to get him to come tonight. Unfortunately, he was already booked, so um, it was a last-minute request. But so, but we're comfortable continuing on right now. Yes, I think so. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Can I get two minutes before we start? Before we get into the next subject, could we ask that the sign-in sheet be passed around and make sure that everybody is on there, please? Good idea. Because I know that yeah, some so people have signed. So if you didn't sign the sign-in sheet, there's a clipboard on the table over there. If you could just make sure to sign it, please. That way we'll know you're here. Diana, do you need us when he comes back to accept the meeting minutes? Yes. No, we can call it whatever I mean, we want. Something. Come up with a better name. No, I got that from another town, but you're right. It is, I was thrown off by it at first, too, but then I'm like, oh, well, it's adult use versus I know, medical. I understand. Like we could call it recreational. Right. <laughs> or... I was going to get it aside my desk. So think of, put your creative thinking cap on. Just goes to show where I was my mind out. is at. I know. <laughs> I was tapped out on creative thinking at that point. So is there no vegetation up there? Is that why they get that buffer? Yeah, this is already buffered. buffered. Okay. Yeah, it's already buffered. I believe this is already buffered. Um, Jeff, just we we so, I mean, this is a touch point, but this house is a big yeah. And Gary and I were talking, this is actually... Uh, Killed a lot of trees here, Jeff. This is actually a uh, so there is a name on it. Oh, you by the page. I have a 42 inch monitor at work. Okay, before we, before we proceed to the next item, I just need to do a uh, housekeeping thing, which is we have, there's some minutes from February 24th, 2022. Has everyone had a chance to read those? Yes. yes. Yeah. A motion. I make a motion to accept the meeting minutes from February 24th, 2022. Second that. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Mr. Lovely. An informal discussion on 10 Mechanic Street. See, you've got your hands full tonight. I'll try to be quick on this. Okay. 
Uh, this is going to be coming to you as a special permit um, site plan review and we'll have to do design review as well. This is the existing building at 10 Mechanic Street right next to the Union Straw, the old Legion. Is that the one on the corner? No, no. So if, yeah. if we're facing, if we're on Mechanic facing Union Straw, is Union it Straw is on the left, no, right. to the right. Oh, so right. It's a brick building. It's it's currently it's about a 35, 3700 square foot building. It has a um, computer company in there. The owners now are Jim and Pamela Gibson, and they own the Union Straw Building as well and other properties in that area. Um, so their their proposal under the Foxboro Center Overlay District Bylaw is to convert that building, which is currently one approximately 3500 square foot commercial building into five one-bedroom apartments and one commercial space. Um, the exterior of the building really wouldn't change except they have to build a, uh, uh, a, a porch for the second egress along the east side of the building, which is the Railroad Ave side of the building. Um, they would sprinkler the building. They would build demising walls, uh, the, the plans are there. The facade of the building wouldn't change. The site of the building really wouldn't change. They are proposing to remove about 900 plus square feet of what is existing pavement, um, run their roof drains into the soil under there and put a lawn area where it's currently paved. Um, so we're, we're, we'll be looking for a special permit for that conversion. And also, uh, I think we need to go through design review, even though there are very few changes to the exterior appearance of the building, other than the addition of sort of a rear porch deck and a, and a side porch deck to give the necessary egress for the apartments. Um, there is sufficient parking. I think if we can get maybe detail, I don't know if Paige or Gabby have detail for bicycle parking. There's room there uh, to add some bicycle parking on the site. Um, so we think it's a, a relatively uh, straightforward project with, um, with some benefit to the downtown. When I get calls about what's going on downtown, I'd say I get 10 requests to find somebody a residence for every one that I get to talk about commercial space. And I think one of the things that you know we talk about doing is adding some foot traffic to the downtown area to support those existing downtown businesses. Uptown. 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 You, I didn't man. used to hang around there when I was in high school, but I, so I forget what we call it. I've been brainwashed over the six years I've been here, and every time you say downtown, I'm like, she gets yelled at. Wow. Okay. Yeah. The, the common area. Yes. There we go. So that I know you guys have uh, a lot of work to do. We'll be filing this, but I didn't know if there were any initial questions, concerns. No, there's ample parking on site. Um, the one question I had, because you referred to the back as a deck slash access. It really, it's just a stairway, I think. It's right, well, a, yeah. yeah, stairway I'd be more comfortable with than saying putting a deck out there, because I don't think there's enough room. Yeah, it's more like a stairway, just. Right. Yeah. But he referred to it as a deck. So. The porch. And it's written as a deck on the well, land. On the side lives, but the back. Is strictly four. Yeah, the side is over. Which one is he talking about? Deck. Oh, that it's one. The dark one in the back, Tracy. Gotcha. So. Well, the intent is to build it at with those dimensions. It's I don't see that it would be a place to really hang out multiple units. No, no, I was just concerned about when you're referring to it as deck slash right. porch that approximately the lot line be pretty close. We out, and that's one of the one of the requests is. Under the general business district, there's a zero sideline. Under the FCOD, there's a 10-foot sideline. Your board has the power to waive that, and we would be requesting that waiver because it does get over to about 2.4 feet off, okay. off the sideline. But that's necessary for the multifamily right. access. 
I think just the main thing, like you recall, because of um, Mr. Gibson's project next to your building, um, we'll want to make sure we look at the drainage because, you know, we know uptown is constrained with the site, lot size and whatnot. But so we just want to make sure that whatever is being done will improve and not make worse. So, and I know you are removing, so it's probably presumed it'll be better, but right. we'll, I think that would be the one thing we'd want to just make sure. Even though Mr. Rhodes isn't here anymore, we wouldn't want to let him down on... Uh, he, was the <laughs> <drainage>. <laughs> he was the drainage person, I'm the lighting person. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's the thought behind removing some of the pavement mm -hmm. and then running the um, roof drains so they recharge right. on, under that grass area. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mr. Gibson owns other properties in that area, as do I, and he's he's trying to improve the drainage because everything kind of flows down to my to building. You. <laughs> to you, yeah. So you have a vested interest in that, yeah. yeah. We talked about picking up a little bit. Yeah. How old is that building? Do you know, I'm roughly. Not sure. It's not a. It's. I didn't it's, think it's that old. It's probably 60s, 70s. It's yeah. not of any particular right. architectural merit. I don't think. I think that before Gerard bought it. It may have been all apartments at one time, and then was it? Had, there was a hair salon in there at one time mm -hmm. for a while. Yeah. yeah. Right, it's been a few different yeah. things, but yeah. Okay. Actually, it looks kind of straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it looks pretty vanilla. Nothing major. And it, almost nothing changes on the outside except for a few minor drainage improvements. So, so the... So the, the um, Downstairs, usually that office is going to retain its use as an office. Is that the idea that one little block? So of the of the six units, there'll be one sixth of the building, the front on the Mechanic Street yeah. side, first floor. Right. And I don't even know what's going there at this point. Some kind of probably a hairdresser or. A so the computer company is leaving. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Gibson bought it from them. I don't know where they're leaving to. Hopefully locally, but uh, not, they're not going to be there. Gotcha. So the rear setback is the only way of you'd be looking for? It's actually a side setback side on the side. east side, I believe so. Yeah. And we do need to go through design review, but we're not really changing the exterior. And I guess we'd run site plan at the same time. So. Do you have any sense of the size of these apartment, like square footage wise? I would say they're just doing the math, they're probably between six and seven hundred square feet. You know, they, they lay out just two rooms really, a bedroom and a combined living kitchen, one bath. Cool. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Being uh, sometimes slightly past 7:45 p.m., we have a public hearing, special permit, site plan, west side of Route One, construct four new parking lots and perform improvements to four existing parking lots by NPS LLC. Um, I know that there's a lot of people here tonight. Um, Aside from the representatives of the craft group to uh, attend this hearing and I just since many of you have never been here before or may not attend meetings of this nature very frequently let me just explain to you how this is going to work the applicant I'm sorry can I do, can you just go ahead and, and open the make a motion to open it and then leave the reading sure just to make sure. okay I'll do that I make a motion to open the public hearing second all those in favor aye. Aye. aye I make a motion to waive the reading Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Back to uh, my little speech here for, for the audience. <laughs> the applicants and or their representatives will make their presentation. The board will take its time to just ask questions, make comments, etc. Once we're done that, we will open it up to the public. You just have to raise your hand, go to a microphone, and state your name and address for the record. All right? Thank you very much. Whenever you guys are ready, who'd ever like to take the lead? Thank you. Hello, board, and good evening. Uh, I'd like to introduce the team we have here tonight. Uh, I'm Dan Krantz with the Craft Group. I have Matt and Beth with the Craft Group with me as well. Uh, Peter and Kevin from Goulston Stores, our legal counsel. Uh, Brittany and Derek from VHB, our site civil engineers. And Jeffrey from uh, Vanessa and Associates uh, for traffic. Um, title says it all centralized parking um, you know in our mind it's really not about the net new numbers it's a, it's about options um, we're looking for greater safe operational control 
Um, as this board has heard many times, um, the voice of our fans is important to us. It's important to us to improve the experience. Uh, and you've heard these before as well. The in, the out, and getting through the gates are consistently our three main focuses for improving fan experience. I'll start backwards with the gates. When I was before you previously for the north end zone, we started to talk about some of the new technologies that we're using for security screening and as we're implementing those in 22 and 23. So that we hope to dramatically improve over the coming year. Uh, and then there's the in and the out. And we believe that what we are presenting here tonight will assist with that as well. And we'll get into that detail. Uh, just another point uh, that I'd ask this board to consider is we have been before you and talked about the 1.5 million square feet of future commercial development um, quarter point that in and of itself will impact the available parking as well. Um, I know there is a number of interested parties, interested parties here with us tonight uh, and we look forward to reviewing with them and answering any questions they have. Um, we will be trying to be um, mindful of people's time. So we will try to get through this quickly so we can get to questions and answers. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Peter, who will start you through our uh, remaining agenda and uh, project goals. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, for the record, Peter Tamak Wilson in stores on behalf of the craft group. Um, Brittany, if we can um, shift slides. I, I wanted to touch quickly, and I promised Dan I'd be quick, um, and I, <laughs> um, on, on just the process. This is the beginning of a, a public process. Um, I think um, a number of uh, stakeholders and neighbors uh, are interested in, and have shared uh, already uh, um, concerns um, about the project. So we want to both uh, proactively uh, explain to you what the project is, what it isn't, and also uh, address questions to the extent we can, understanding that this process is going to be uh, one of information gathering, uh, information uh, providing, providing answers, and then ultimately working with the board and with the stakeholders um, to find solutions so that this project can be a success. As Dan mentioned, this is uh, critical to stadium operations. Um, and as, his, as he outlined the goals, uh, the focus is really on identifying areas uh, where greater efficiencies can be gained uh, to allow for parking in a centralized area that is safe and secure and under stadium control. Um, you'll hear from Jeffrey Dirk later uh, about why that's important for both traffic and safety, and that's been consistent with uh, our mission before you over the past years. Um, the area of focus that Brittany and Matt will talk about is the west side of Route 1. And uh, this is an area that's zoned uh, predominantly, uh, it's entirely within the S1, and is predominantly overlaid by the Economic Development Overlay District. The use uh, and is existing in this area, and uh, the use is allowed as of right within the EDA and subject to a special permit for a limited portion uh, within the S1. Um, in terms of zoning compliance, the plans submitted fully comply with all zoning requirements, and that can be confirmed um, uh, both with staff and with council if necessary. Um, there are some questions about both setbacks, uh, which you'll see, as well as buffers. Um, to the neighborhood in particular, uh, to the areas to Norfolk and to Walpole. And um, I'll outline that there are no setbacks that apply to a parking project. Setbacks apply to a building project, a structure. That said, there, there is no structure here. So there are no setback requirements for a parking project. Um, there are buffer requirements, but they do not apply to a rear yard. So there are no buffer requirements either. When we first contemplated a project here and when the design team was looking at that, we did that analysis. We understood that. This was um, something that we were before the board 
15 years ago <coughs> when a number of these lots were constructed and expanded, and we looked at the same issues. Um, in identifying where the property boundaries lie, the project has evolved. And I think what you'll see, and Brittany will outline, is um, some pretty good buffers have been established. And that's perhaps, um, it's our obligation to show you that on a plan. And it's also our obligation to show you where uh, additional supplemental buffers and fencing are going to be provided. So we'll walk through that. Um, but, but really, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the summary from a process standpoint. The site plan, we fully expect uh, we'll be working with you on uh, details regarding the vehicular movements and circulation, signage, lighting, <coughs> operations, the typical site plan issues. Um, in terms of buffers, we fully expect that um, the plans that we'll show you tonight uh, will at least inform you and show you where buffers are provided and where we think they need to be supplemented. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt Pekarski. Good evening. Uh, for the record, Matthew Pekarski with the Craft Group. Um, just like to pick up with where uh, Dan kind of left off with the voice of the, the fan and the feedback that we consistently get. Um, obviously, as Dan alluded to, without repeating everything, um, parking, particularly the egress, is the number one issue that we consistently hear. As, uh, as this board will appreciate, we've been before you before for several projects, the uh, employee parking area down behind Bass Pro, Lot 18, the Route 140 connector driveway, re as recently as last year, we were back before you with some modifications for that. We've done numerous uh, changes and implementations to the tra traffic management plan along Route 1. Um, to you know, all, all in the vein and, and with the goal of improving the game day experience, particularly the egress out of uh, following any event, not just football, but concerts and everything, all the other major stadium events. So that's really wh why we're here tonight. <coughs> excuse me to present this uh, what we feel is kind of the next phase of uh, the improvements in our ongoing efforts to to improve uh, the the game day experience. Um, flip to the next slide here. So as far as the existing conditions go, and Peter kind of alluded to this, uh, th this project is, is focused on the west side of Route 1. Um, just by way of orientation for the board and those that are watching, uh, the stadium is just uh, slightly off the page here. You can see the north part of Patriot Place in the bottom of the page. Route 1 is running across the, the uh, lower third of the page here um, from left to right, with north being to the right. And then the parking lots across the street are all of the uh, P10 and P11 parking lots all in here in this area. These are the existing parking lots, and, and this is primarily the area of the project um, overall. The, the, <clears throat> the, the overarching goal of, the pro of this particular phase of the improvements is really to improve the, the what we call the, uh, the in and the out. It's the ingress and the egress of the traffic. Um, but it's also about uh, you know, providing the parking department and, the, and the, their operations team more flexibility and adaptability to the situations. Um, without getting into all the details, you know, a concert's different than a preseason game, which is different than a, than a postseason, you know, AFC championship playoff game. The dynamics are different, time of day, weather, all those factors all go in. And having a dynamic and, and the ability to flex into different locations, load multiple lots at different times, and that versatility is very important for the overall operation. And that's part of the goal of this project. In addition, uh, as is always important to us, it's about pedestrian safety, the access, how people get to and from the lots to the stadium safely, um, and avoiding conflicts with vehicles and things of that nature. And it's also, uh, this project is really for us to focus on trying to enhance kind of innovative programs that we've launched in the last few years, particularly the uh, delayed egress or the delayed exit program, which I'll talk about in a little bit. <clears throat> So I'm going to flip to the next slide here. Apologize. I'm trying to get rid of the line we just drew on the screen. I apologize about that. Um, there we go. Thank you. So there's a lot going on in this slide here, and there's a lot of information uh, being contained here. But generally, this is kind of, I'll give you an overview of the project. 
Uh, what you see in here, there, there are really six areas of the existing parking lots that we're enhancing. Um, and and two, of the, two of the six are, are brand new uh, parking lots, lots 44 and 45. They don't currently exist today. Three of the six areas are uh, what I'll call uh, expansions of existing parking lots, lot 42, 43, and 55B. And the last one, the sixth location, is really just, uh, it's really a combination or, or a consolidation of two existing parking lots. Uh, and again, that's just for efficiencies in the operation. In total, it's, uh, it's about a net gain of just over 3,000 spaces. Uh, and that's you know, in the context of the 9,000 spaces that are already across the street in P10 and P11. Um, so th that's generally the, the size and, and scale of, of the project um, over, overall. It's important to note, I think, as part of this too, is that we're talking about a net increase in parking spaces. We're not talking about a net increase in vehicles coming down on the corridor. We're not adding tickets. We're not adding new programs. We're not bringing more people to the stadium. It's about increasing the capacity of the available parking on the corridor. And again, allowing for that flexibility and, and uh, dynamic operation. In terms of the ingress itself, it's really no different than what's happening today. And, and the, the, the beauty of this project is it's really uh, taking advantage of all the existing infrastructure that's in place. So it's an expansion of an existing lot. It's utilizing existing walkways and things of that nature, which I'll go through here in a minute. But generally speaking, coming from the north, which is highlighted in the red on this particular graphic, if you're coming from the north on Route 1, you're going to basically turn into P10 North as you would any other you know, past 10, 15 years or as long as that's been there, I guess. Um, and then you would proceed to park in any of the particular lots. If you're participating in the delayed egress or delayed exit lot, that would be obviously be lot 55 as noted on this plan here. And again, I'll talk about that in a second. If you're coming in from the south, again, we'd be utilizing the same setup on Route 1, basically the same operation of the traffic management plan, no wholesale changes proposed as a result of this project. Um, you'd be coming in primarily P10 South or P11 as two main entry points into the parking lots. Um, and the one slight change to the south this year that's been used at different points in the past, but we'd like to formalize it a little bit more now, is the use of Lincoln Road to Annette Road to access lots 44 and 45. And that's mainly for two functions. One, it's proximity to, you know, it's just, it's easier to get to those lots from the Annette Road, which we have direct frontage on to. And it's also because, um, you know, we're earmarking uh, at least lot 45. Um, as part of our uh, delayed egress uh, parking lot program that we have. So with that, I'll, I'll take a second and, and just kind of explain the, the delayed parking uh, concept for those if the board's not aware of it. But uh, the program itself started back in 2018, and the, overall, the goal of the, of, the, of the program is basically just, just that. It's to delay the number of cars that are trying to get out into Route 1 at the same time. So if you can picture, you know, if there's 9,000 cars across the street trying to get out to Route 1, every one car that we can stop from going out there, at least in that first, you know, critical window of the first 60 minutes, 70 minutes or so, becomes, uh, it relieves the congestion and the pressure on Route 1 and allows those that are wishing to leave the ability to go. Program has been extremely successful since we implemented it. Started off averaging probably five to 600 vehicles, and as recently as this past year, we're averaging 1,000 to uh, 1,200 vehicles within the program. The incentive, I guess, if you will, to participate in that is that it's it's free parking. So it waives the $40 parking fee. You're allowed to go in and park, but the caveat is that you wait until 75 minutes after the game ends before you can leave the parking lot. Strategically, uh, the existing operation has existed in lot 55 for, again, since 2018. The capacity of that lot is, you know, on paper, it's 1,300 spaces, which means in practice it's about 1,200 or something, a little less than that because it's a dirt lot. Um, but it, it's, it's been where we've outgrown the space for it uh, to a large degree. And there's another kind of operational flaw with it, if you will, in terms of having to cross traffic through the P10 parking lots. So as if you're coming from the north, it's a great, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You come in P10 north, you shoot, shoot straight into lot 55 and you'd park and obviously you'd egress out the same way. If you're coming from the south, you come into the P10 south, you have to go down all the way through the parking lot and then across P10 and then back into 55. It's a little bit circuitous. It's hard to manage on game day um, as from, from the parking staff perspective. And it's just a lot more interaction with vehicles and fans than we would otherwise like. So we try to, you know, we'd like to try to minimize that to the extent that we can. The um, 
the, the project before us tonight is really the goal is to take this successful program and actually bifurcate the, the north and the south parking. So because we're running out of space in 55 to begin with, you know, we'd like to keep a portion of this to the north and lot 55, and we'd like to designate some lots to the south um, as, as the delayed uh, exit lots to the south. Again, the, the, the numbers for each game change, as you can imagine and suspect. A Sunday at 1 o'clock in September is very popular because people don't mind hanging out, but a night game, generally speaking, the numbers are far lower, and people don't necessarily want to stay uh, any longer than they otherwise feel they have to. <clears throat> so that's, that's kind of the program itself as a whole. I, I guess I'd end by saying it's a, for us it's, a, it's been a very successful and critical component of the game day improvements that we've made um, just because we have seen, you know, the feedback has been positive. It's for those that, you know, don't necessarily want to pay the fee and they're going to hang out at Patriot Place anyways, then it's a great opportunity. Um, and for those that want to leave, obviously, and are obviously paying the fee, then it allows them a little less friction to get out of the parking lot. Um, one thing I would like to point out, and based on some of the feedback that we've received and some of the comments, is I think there's a little bit of a misconception for the delayed lot. I, I, if you think about the overall operations, you know, obviously this is a function of the game and the weather and many uh, factors that go into it, but it's not a net increase in the time that people are in the parking lots. These, if you'll notice, these lots, whether it's in its current location in 55 or as proposed in this plan, are strategically located to basically be the furthest away, kind of buried in the back, if you will. They're lots that would otherwise, you know, people would be sitting there a long time anyways. This is just ensuring that they're going to sit there. They're not going to try to commingle with everybody who's trying to get out that would necessarily be ahead of them. So to that end, you know, if you're in the back of 55, it's a, it's a self-contained, easy lot to manage. And it's something that the parking department and the, uh, in this case, you know, state police across the street, they assist with managing it. And the same thing would be true for, you know, lot 45 and if needed, you know, lot 44. Um, it, it depended upon what the demand is. As far as egressing from, <clears throat> from the lots, and particularly from the south, we've been mindful of that as well. Um, so, you know, we, I mentioned earlier that, you know, cars would want to be coming in to uh, load 45 and 46 by Lincoln Road or Annette Road. We'd be looking to try to have them egress out the same way. Because it's a delayed lot, it actually sets up pretty well because the Lincoln Road at Route 1 is, has a lot of pedestrian foot traffic that crosses it uh, post event, particularly with that, say, the first, you know, 35 to 40 minutes after a game. People are leaving the stadium, walking to their... If they're parked south of Lincoln Road, you know, at Lafayette or Seasonal or uh, America's Best, there's a fair amount of people that walk down through there. By these being a delayed lot and egressing out that way, it sets up pretty well because they wouldn't be going out until 75 minutes after, which is, by that point, you know, the majority of the traffic is, foot traffic that is, has passed uh, Lincoln Road and the conflict is easily managed by the existing state police details that are out there. So that's a delayed uh, egress parking <clears throat> from a um, <clears throat> from an ingress or I'm sorry from egress overall this is the, the actually the next slide it shows it's basically the reverse it, and I want to oversimplify it but again same traffic management setup same uh, operation on route one and generally speaking here is again same color scheme if you park to the north or, uh, or the delayed lot you're going to come out of these what as shown on these lots is the red line you're going to come out p10 north and go up route one if you park to the south, you're going to come back out uh, either P P10 south or P11. You know, we're not going to change our practice. It's basically first in, first out is, is generally the way the lots are managed. Um, but it just uh, it allows with the internal circulation of some of these roads, particularly within P11, um, that operation will be a lot smoother and a lot easier for us to, to process vehicles um, in and out. And as I mentioned earlier, in that road, you know, with the delayed exit, will be will operate in that similar fashion. I think the only other thing that I'll say is, um, just generally speaking, from a safety standpoint, again, I mentioned earlier, we're always mindful of that. Um, we're we're going to, we're taking this program, we're, we're using the existing infrastructure that's out there, the, the walkways, um, you know, obviously the, the lighting. We're mindful of the safety. We're trying to put the walkways in thoughtful meaningful areas that will actually be used um, with combination of signage, combination of six foot, you know, chain link fence to contain and to keep people separate from 
um, from the vehicle uh, flow and where we do have to cross people even within our <coughs> internal parking lots we've designed this so that we're we're doing that at a controlled point if you will um, again vehicles and people don't mix for the obvious safety reasons but they more you know don't mix ease either from the operational standpoint because it's just friction and every time you have to stop cars that's part of the part of the uh, the challenge and to that end I'd say from a bigger picture perspective you know that's also some of the benefits of you know this centralized concept of bringing uh, more cars to the center of the stadium um, one it, it allows us to control them better but it also helps to reduce the amount of pedestrians that are walking north and south on route one itself crossing up at North Street crossing down at P9 um, that's that's all friction that slows the overall progression of vehicles leaving here and again that just adds to time in terms of the overall egress which is as I mentioned our main goal here to to reduce that as much as possible so that's the operational aspect of it with that I'm going to turn it over to Jeffrey Dirk um, he's gonna be able to speak to the uh, the actual traffic impact assessment I just ask you one question before sure. Jeff starts so p55b is that existing today that is not existing today okay so that's so that's also like the other two green ones that's a new that's a new it would be new area. it's basically it, it will be physically connected to 55 yeah, yeah. but it's like, like an extension i just wanted to clarify 55. that and then the only other question i have for right now is does this pertain to football only is it going to be in use for concerts or any major stadium event okay. <clears throat> kevin one quick question just uh, for clarification purposes uh annette road only for those two delay exit lots uh, not necessarily. We, we, it's one of the things we've been talking with uh, both the state and local uh, police on the chief and, and, um, and um, um, Lieutenant Curtin on it is just if there's an ability to push, it, it's all going to come down to timing, right? So by the time we would actually be able to be in a position to put cars out there, and yeah. you've got to figure they're probably coming from somewhere in the back of 42 or the back of yeah. 43, if it's easy enough to redirect them, if you've been you've been in the lot so you know when you get a, a platoon of cars all going in one direction it's very difficult to turn a lot of them around so it's one of those things that we'd like to reserve the right to send them out that way if we can if we can easily do it operationally just curious thank you yeah and 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 i should point out too it's actually i'm not directly running the parking operations anymore on game day but i know from this past season they have been doing that actually and it's been working out pretty successful they've been doing it to kind of test out the the lincoln road part and waiting until you know 60 minutes after um just to see how see how that operationally works okay. kevin i do have one question and one point of clarification uh, matt you're saying it's a 75 minute delay from the end of the game correct most of these people will be reaching these lots by foot within 30 minutes so you're only looking at about a 40 45 minute delay actually in the lot correct okay the the question i had was is there going to be anything in place to keep these people from becoming disorderly so because that i know is going to be an important question for the question. sure it, it, it's it's <coughs> we would treat it as any of our parking lots so you know event uh, team op securities in the parking lot state police are in the parking lots it's being patrolled yep. Um, depending upon the type of event, you know, we were talking about this earlier, is it's kind of consistent with our concert practices anyways. We don't allow tailgating post-event, which usually is not an issue anyways. People want to pack up and leave. Right. And I'd say the same thing for the night games for football. Generally speaking, okay. people don't, uh, don't stay. Um, you know, th th it would be consistent with the rest of the management of the parking lots. Okay. Now, I've seen in some of the private lots that post-games, there's bonfires. And sure. So just reassuring the people. it's the same protocol that i mean you guys know our operation we have the we have the the presence of police is 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 a lot and um and and, and even from the fire perspective foxborough fire doesn't leave our parking lots until they go through and they would extinguish any fires that are out there they okay. check all the trash barrels it's standard operating procedure for yeah. them all right thank you jeffrey yep. thank you good evening mr chairman members of the board for the record jeffrey dirk with vanessa and associates with a transportation consultants um, for the project and for the craft group um, so I think kind of the following along with the theme that you heard, just to kind of start, um, there's no increase in stadium capacity. We're not adding any amenities, so there's no increase in traffic other than the localized increase we'd have associated with loading the lots, essentially, along the front of the stadium. So as soon as you get out of the frontage of the stadium itself from the standpoint of Route 1 and local roadways, there's no change in terms of uh, traffic flow or traffic patterns. 
the purpose of this plan really is consistent with, I think, a lot of the stadium enhancements we've done with respect to parking. It's really about um, dispersal of traffic, it's traffic control, also relating to pedestrians, and it's about safety. So consistent with all of that, uh, what we're doing, as you see, is really creating some additional lots across the street, which allows us to have more parking that's really under control of the traffic management plan. As you know, it's a very carefully planned uh, traffic management plan that deals with both pedestrians and vehicles along the frontage of the stadium. The refinements that have been consistently taking place with respect to that plan is really, as Matt was talking about, dealing with the friction as you get away from the stadium. We have a lot more control over what happens with the stadium lots, dealing with the egress, and as Matt was mentioning, dispersal relating to this new program with the delayed exit, that helps a lot in terms of spreading out the traffic itself. Uh, but as you get away from the stadium, as additional traffic comes in and adds into the traffic management plan and vehicles are turning left or right trying to get in, out of, in and out of those lots, it does create some friction which creates backups. Having more parking proximate to the stadium uh, alleviates some of that friction and that what it will improve the overall flow of traffic along the corridor itself. And so that's a major piece of this. The other thing is you look at safety. Um, as you know, we have two major pedestrian crossings, one between P10 North and P10 South, that zone of pedestrian safety across Route 1. And then we also have the, over, the overpass of Route 1. As you look at kind of where these additional lots are located and you follow the pedestrian paths, I think one of the things that the town um, and the traffic control officers, the detail officers out there, have always been trying to encourage more use of that overpass because in that point it's not crossing or conflicting with any of the vehicular traffic. So if you look at where the majority of these lots are and where those pedestrian paths are, it focuses that where that goal would be, which is to use the overpass more heavily and in fact, as Matt was mentioning, how we have planned out the pedestrian routes, they feed directly into that overpass area. So, you know, it also achieves that goal of trying to f push more of the pedestrian traffic over to that area. Lastly, with respect to the, um, the egress, one of the things that has uh, been done over the past year is an opening of the breakdown lane just after the overpass where the traffic comes onto Route 1. Um, that was done to allow, again, eliminate some of that friction. There are lots today that are private lots that have parking along Lincoln Road and then that road, they feed down into that lane that's been opened in the breakdown lane. One of the reasons that was opened was to um, push, as Matt was describing, move the traffic away from the stadium more efficiently. Um, what you see in terms of the delayed lots as well is you see that it feeds right into that lane. And the purpose in this instance of the delayed lots is it still maintains the integrity of that extra lane because if those vehicles aren't leaving until 75 minutes after the, delay, after the game is finished, those lots that are external to the stadium, they still get the benefit of using that lane. So they're exiting those lots before we start introducing any additional traffic into that extra lane from Annette Road. So it's been purposely designed that way so that it, it maintains the integrity and the efficiency of that. So this plan is really just kind of following up on the constant approach to trying to look at, again, dispersal of traffic, putting more traffic under the stadium's uh, traffic control plan along the stadium frontage, and then pedestrian safety has always been uh, a, a part of all of these plans, um, and you'll see the routes have been very deliberately planned, and Matt had described the separation, and purposely you see where we're trying to eliminate any pedestrian crossings of major flows of ingress or egress of vehicles in those lots. So I'll turn it back over. Thank you. Can I ask one other quick question? So other than the verbal contract that you have with the free parking people, how do you actually prevent them from leaving in that 75 minute window? Does so, it actually put cones up? Do you put? So that's part of why if you look at where these lots are located, they're, they're in, I'll, I'll use the existing lot 55 as an example, but it, the same applies to these lots that we're looking at for future consideration too. Um, it's, it's based on just, it's only one entry point to simplify it. So literally we, we put Jersey barrier out. It's not that they can't get out. So the policy is if you choose, so on entry, you're, we actually do it through passes. So people register ahead of time so that we can gauge the level of interest and then respond accordingly. As people arrive, they say you know, they've got their pass and that's mainly to give them directions to tell them how to get there. That's our communication with them. They arrive, they are you know, reminded that it's no, no fee to park, but you gotta wait till 75 minutes. 
and not a problem, but things happen. People need to leave, whatever the case may be. If they leave prior to the 75 minutes, they just pay the $40 on the way out. So that becomes the, det the deterrent so people don't abuse it. So it's not that we try to stop them. It's just it's enforced on the exit. After 75 minutes, it's wide open and they just flow out. And at that point, the majority of the traffic's gone anyways. So they have, it's actually a better experience for a lot of them because they have easier access right on to Route 1, albeit at the tail end of the traffic, but there's, you know, it's flowing better. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brittany Gessner, and I'm the civil engineer for the project with VHB. Um, I will try to keep this as brief as possible in the interest of time. Um, so just to echo what folks before me have said, there are about six locations um, where we're proposing work. You can see on this plan the red zone line. Um, all of the lots are completely within the S1 zoning district, and the red line delineates which lots are the lots to the left are within the S1, and the lots to the right are within the S1 and the EDA overlay district. Um, so the ones that are only S1, we, we are requesting a special permit, but the ones that are in the S1 and the EDA, those are by right. Um, so just a reminder, we have these, these two new lots, 45 and 44, and then, um, oh, and 43, and then we have this expansion, this expansion, and then the combination of the two lots. So all of these lots are gravel lots that's consistent with the existing <coughs> conditions across the campus. All of the main roadways, so this centralized connector right here, that is paved, um, and that is also consistent with what's out there across the campus. Um, the paved, paved centralized roadway lot, but all of the lots are proposed to be gravel. So we've designed um, a stormwater management system for the, the project, and it is in accordance with the state um, stormwater management handbook is also in accordance with the local uh, Foxborough rules and regulations for stormwater. Um, included in that design, we are um, designing to detain stormwater runoff. We design that the pr in proposed conditions, stormwater will go to the exact same place that it goes under existing conditions. We will not be directing it to any new place. It goes to exactly where it goes today, except we detain it so that we do not increase peak rates in the 2, 10, 25, or 100 year storm. And also in accordance with your local rules and regulations, we will not be increasing volumes of runoff in the one year storm. Um, we, are per we have nine infiltration basins on this side of the campus. Three of those are existing and we're pro proposing six new infiltration basins. According to the state stormwater handbook, we are required to recharge um, a little over 70,000 cubic feet of stormwater, and we are proposing to recharge a little over 290,000 cubic feet of recharge. So it's about four times what is required by the state stormwater handbook. As far as treatment, all the stormwater runoff will be treated by infiltration. Um, that will involve a 94% removal of total suspended solids, a 91% removal of total phosphorus, and one and a half inches of stormwater across the entire site will be retained and infiltrated using all of those basins. All of that exceeds the requirements in both the state and local rules and regulations. Um, the last item that I do wanna mention on stormwater is we have provided, we have prepared a very thorough stormwater management report and that has been peer reviewed by a third party professional engineer. We did receive their comment letter this, this morning. I went through it. Um, I, I feel very confident that we can easily address all of their comments um, and we look forward to doing that in, in the coming week or two weeks or so. On this plan, um, there's three things we're showing. We're showing lighting. Lighting is represented by the, the thick black dots throughout. We're showing fencing, which is represented by the yellow linear features that go around the perimeter of all the lots. And then we will be discussing buffers a bit. Lighting is proposed um, in accordance with all local standards and will mimic existing lighting across the campus. And we are proposing house shields on all of the light poles around the perimeter of the, the lots in the, the campus. Um, as far as fencing, we are proposing fencing around the perimeter of all the lots. You can see that here um, with the yellow linear features and around all of the stormwater basins as well. As far as buffers, this light green hatch 
represents the existing naturalized buffer that will remain, um, with the exception of, of over on the left here. This is a proposed stormwater basin, so that, that will be a stormwater basin area. All the rest of this is um, proposed naturalized buffer that will remain. Um, and this bright green feature here, this is a proposed berm that will be planted and will have a fence running wrong along the entire length of it. Um, all the other areas, there's a naturalized topographical change between the lots and the perimeter of the property. Um, How high will the berm be? The berm, uh, approximately seven feet. Um, with that, um, we are happy to entertain any questions, comments, discussions, provide any more details you might like to hear. Probably for Matt. Um, what is the current capacity of 55? Uh, it's about 1,300 spaces, I believe, is what it was the site, previous site plan approved. And again, just so I am clear, that's the extent of the current program, the delayed exit program. Well, yes, from a practical standpoint, yeah. From uh, yeah, the ability to manage the current program as it is, because it's the lot that, the one lot that's really self co is uh, contained. And going forward, we'll, the proposal would be to maintain A as also delayed exit or no? No, I think the we'd love to be in a position where we could be if the demand was there, um, but we would, we would look to start with B. And again, because it's buried further back, it has one point of entry, it would be easy to operationalize and manage. Okay. So does that 1300 include the new 752? No, no. Okay. that'd be an addition. Is that an additional berm behind uh, 55 B? A new berm now? Doc Green. There's a natural topographical change um, between our lot and the abutting properties. I mean, it's showing it in the deep green, as you had mentioned, behind 42. Do you know the height on it? I will get that for you. The, park, the parking lot's cut into the ill there, so it's not say naturally yeah. grow. Yeah, I just like to understand, you know, we've got a seven point berm. Uh, seven point berm that we're discussing over here. What is it over there? Uh, Mr. Whitehouse and I were looking at these plans earlier today. We got a concern with the far right hand side of 55B. Um, could there be any buffering done there to the abutter? Because it is in very close proximity. I do know, understand that this is in the by right zone, so I'm only asking. That's the property you want. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. I, I would say we would take that under consideration. Okay. Absolutely. What, can you confirm again what's in by right? Which, I know what by right is, but which ones are by Everything, right? <coughs> go back a couple yeah. of pages. Everything. Uh, yeah, but you go back, please. Okay, there we go. No, nope, not that one, please. This one, right here. Everything to the left of that line is special permit. Everything to the right of that line this. is by right. So this is by right? Everything that way is by right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So 50, just to clarify for everybody, so 55 is by right, yeah. 42, 41 by right. The only ones that are special permit of 44 and 45. Okay. To answer your question regarding um, the grade separation, it's about 10 feet. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Well, especially since it's by right. Anything else from the board at the moment? Yeah. Um, so to go back, um, just to recap, because uh, this is early on in the presentation. So we're looking at a net increase in spaces of about 3,000? Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, and mainly to provide just additional flexibility in staging both in and out depending on conditions it, it, yes to provide flexibility in operations the ability to load multiple lots at one time i mean there's a lot of factors that obviously go into that sure. not the least of which is you know as everyone knows these days getting staff is yeah. part of the challenge to actually run the operations um but also um it, it's also as dan alluded to early on is you know we're still actively pursuing quarter point, right? So to have the flexibility during the construction of that as well is also a, a, a you know, right. 
possible use and but, need. And public safety continues to be concerned about pedestrian movements. And, and, and to Matt's point earlier, just get some focus to a place where they cross Route 1 at a place where it's intended to cross Route 1, not by sure. Basketball Drive where right. they're trying to spread across Route 1. So to get them into the back of these lots, um, they'll cross at a point where it's controlled. So again, and I'm not meaning to be uh, deliver anything, but this is all plus parking to improve the situation, improve flow, and improve the experience. Um, was there anything, I guess I, what I'm getting at is, is 3,000 sort of like the max figure? Is, was there any consideration? I'm just curious about how that kind of evolved as opposed to say 2,500 or maybe 3,500. I think I'll uh, defer to Brittany, but from a site civil standpoint, the 3,000 is kind of the maximum that we is can max? with, with okay. respect, respecting the wetland buffers and things of that nature. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Just to build off that, we are staying entirely out of any buffer zones to wetlands. Um, so this was, this was designed to what we could fit on the site and design an appropriate um, stormwater management system that will accommodate the runoff from these gravel lots in accordance with, with the local and state requirements and stay at least 100 feet away from any and all regulated wetlands. Okay. I, I just wasn't sure whether that number was developed in an operational way to meet operational needs. Question. 3,000 more spots, but you're not expecting more cars. Help me understand that, please. So the, the total capacity of the stadium is not changing. There's nothing changing with respect to Patriot Place or the stadium itself. So in terms of the amount of pedestrians or patrons that can be accommodated, that's fixed. That's I get not that. Changing. The, there will be a localized increase in traffic once you get, let's say, um, south or west of North Street because more traffic, if, if people come, more traffic proceeds into these lots, then basically between P10 North and Bass Pro Drive with, or Lincoln Road, within that area, there'll be, there will be an increase in traffic associated with the additional parking spaces. It's really once you get beyond that, that it doesn't change. The overall volume of traffic that's arriving and departing, that won't change. It just will change what happens in front of the stadium. But I think, Tracy, what it is too, is what Jeff was saying, is that um, this gives them more control it's freezing in here. Um, <laughs> that it gives the stadium more control. Like right now, they don't have the control off the off-site lots that they do and the effect on the traffic flow. So I think that this is the stadium's attempt to have more of their own control over the spaces. Am I, is that kind of? That's, that's a, correct, yeah. That, that's a fair statement. And I think to, to, to build off of that as well, the, you know, this, uh, don't quote me on the numbers. I'm going to say it's roughly 26,000 spaces on the corridor. We have about 22,000 of those. There's four, it's probably about four and a half, five thousand 5,000 satellite spaces that are out there. Uh, we don't control them. There's nothing to prevent any one of those lots from developing into some higher and better use tomorrow. And But yet we're still going to have the same number of fans coming down. So it's also about just self-preservation of our operations and the ability to accommodate the fans. So there's no one particular factor. I think it's a combination of everything. Do you see do you see um, a diminishment of people on the stadium site itself to go take advantage of these lots, or probably not? Uh, I I don't. It, it's a good question, and it's that's looking into the crystal ball. Like I, I think the part of this too, and again, this is getting into the details of the changing dynamic of the team and and the fans that are coming down. But there's. The, the diehard fans that came down to six or seven of the eight games doesn't happen anymore. There's in the neighborhood of, uh, I want to say it's in the neighborhood of 30%, 34% on average of new fans coming down. And we know this through the tracking of tickets. Mm -hmm. We can tell. Those are the people that are coming down who are unfamiliar with the operation, don't know where to park, don't understand the operation, that haven't been coming here for 20-plus years and understand where they're going to go and where they're going to meet their buddy, mm -hmm. things like that. We factor all that into it, and, and that all that also creates fr a friction, and that it, it degrades the game day experience. So we're managing and trying to combat that as well. So from our perspective, having the ability to have centralized parking that we can have clear, consistent messaging to and the operational control over is beneficial, especially to a lot of those first-time people who don't know any better. They don't know to park off-site. They don't know have their favorite spot to go to. The, the other piece of it as well, just with respect to the delayed, the delayed uh, exit, 
the state has been pushing us really to do that with every single incremental change that's happened here. Um, they have asked and pushed for ways to um, moderate the traffic flow along the corridor. So the delayed exit goes along with things that they've been asking us to look at doing as a part of it. Um, the ticket prices or the parking prices they've asked us to look at, the delayed exit is another piece of that um, because as you know, all the money that went into that corridor there, they wanna preserve the capacity. And so they've asked us always consistently to be looking at ways to improve the capacity of the corridor. Obviously, you know, when we did Patriot Place, part of the thought of that was keep people there for a little bit longer after the game. Um, just give another amenity so that we could reduce some of the outflow onto the corridor. The delayed exit goes along with that as well. So it, it kind of goes part and parcel, and that's why, you know, the ability to have these additional spaces and offer that. So there may be some people that say, hey, I'm going to stay there late anyways. If it's free parking, I'll go and use those lots. It's actually a net benefit, and we need to add the parking spaces just to allow that, which is, you know, which is, is in furtherance of the things that the state is asking us to do as well. I'll also add on too, just to, to build off what it, we started this process with actually an RFP process and we solicited all of the existing owners up and down Route 1 and, and you know, basically see, to gauge their interest in either partnering with us operationally, selling out and letting us control their parking. That was the basis of this. The, the base premise from our perspective wasn't to come in and just naturally expand. It was to, again, gain control operational security you know i say security in the context of having spaces um you know that that was the baseline and we basically got zero response we got response but there was nothing that was 10 percent. yeah 10 percent response but none of it materialized into anything that was made sense from a business standpoint that led us to this point where we took you know this what's before us now in, term, in terms of expansion anything else um, yeah, so the, the big elephant in the room is I heard Matt talk about um, the delayed entry and the way he presented it, I get it, um, but I feel like there's a different psychology for delayed entry in the sense of you're saying, well, they would be in line anyway, but when you're jockeying to get in line, you get in your car and you go, but if you know you have 75 minutes to kill, you go back out, you light up the grill, you have another cocktail, you hang out, and um, so I'm just trying to deal with that so two questions is, is there a way to move the delayed parking lots away from the Norfolk and Walpole butters and two is there a way to what is your plans for buffering Peter mentioned they're providing a buffer I see you know some trees there but is there any do you have any cross sections or anything that could show kind of what your plan is or are you doing anything to buffer even if it's not required we are we the berm and the planting of the berm of course none of that's required that's all just in an attempt to to be good neighbors and provide a buffer along there I, I think what I would say is first of all um, to, to Ron's point earlier on it's it takes them 30 minutes more or more to get to the vehicle so I, I'd like to not assume that someone's sitting there for 75 minutes at their car because they're the furthest ones out so it's it, and, and they are offered at Patriot Place I was gonna say we, we have along with this program and we've done this consistently is there's other amenities that go along with it so if you're participating in that program for instance on some of the events um, we open up cross pavilion afterwards there's free soft drinks you know snacks and stuff like that something for them to do so um, a lot of them obviously go to Patriot place some do go back to the parking lots I mean that's that's their choice um, again I think that's more a function of the weather and the time of the day that they would be going back there um, so that was I think that I don't know if that addresses your first question or not but. it does but like as a person who went to you know, every game for 15 years I mean I know there's a big group of people that leave in the third quarter you know because they like the party out in the parking lot more than they like you know the game like it's part of the thing I knew people that went in did a loop and went out so I guess I'm just saying like I get what you're saying for generally but there are always you know the groups that go out there and it's just I don't know if they'll go to that lot or not but it just seems like you're putting the longer tenured people and the they have an incentive to hang out you know because it is a good event especially like on a Sunday night or whatever um, you know at eight o'clock or whatever it's like oh, no stress. so I just I guess I'm just trying to reconcile that I know how it sounds on paper but in real life and practice there are a lot of people that find the parking lot just as fun as the game and I can say that from my own experience not for me I never left the game one minute early but all my people around me were always like oh we're going out to the parking lot so we can drink and not pay whatever the beer prices are there so I just think that there is going to be a natural <laughs> dynamic to hang <coughs> that's our page well the beer sales stop in the third quarter so yeah 
Yeah, so that's what I'm telling you. These people were leaving even before that to go hang in the parking lot. Well, that was one of the questions I asked if they were going to police that so that there is. And, and we would, yeah, we police it in the same, like I said earlier, in the same operation, same vein that we police all of the parking lots that, you know, that we can. I think to, to answer your second question about are there other alternatives or other locations that would that could work, I think the biggest, um, the, the, on the sur at, at first glance and looking at it, we've looked at it quite a bit, I'd say no. And it's primarily because they really, to be successful, they really need to be the furthest lots away. They need to be really, you need the ability to self-contain them. So I couldn't necessarily take any other parking lot in the middle, take, you know, somewhere in the lot 50, how do I contain and operationalize that? to keep those people in there. So by virtue of the fact that in its current configuration, Lot 55 has one entrance in and out, the same would be true for 44 uh, or 45, the same would be true for 55B. It's very easy to operationalize that without having to put, you know, line the whole thing with Jersey barrier or things of that nature that become onerous from an operational standpoint. Yeah, I know, but I mean, I do, I, I understand it. it might be onerous, but it's well, onerous they, too to live next to that. So I guess there's, I mean, you know, well, there are ways to do it. Yeah, 55 is tough, right? Because we have no purview. Well, it's by right. Yeah, it's by right. 44, but I think you have site plan review. Yeah. So you, the use is allowed by right, but you do have input on yep. the layout. But we, you know, we also have the authority to not grant 44, which is close to residents. Grant 45 was just a little bit in unless we get some. Right. Leverage on. Well, 55. I think this group, we all work together. You know, we do. You, you, the, we do. It's the a give state, and take. You know, but the, the planning board is always quite reasonable, and the stadium, you know, we all try to work together. But I think in this instance, you know, there might need to be, I think the term was common courtesy and sort of, you know, find a way to be good neighbors um, and to make sure that we're not sticking it to our neighbors in a way you know so that's and just before I, I mean before i get to the audience which we, which i will in just a minute i mean the other the other thing too is which is why i asked you earlier about is it just football there's a lot of other events some of them are in the summertime some of them are during holiday seasons and things like that 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 these that the neighbors will be affected by theoretically i mean not from the delayed leaving mm -hmm. part but by mm -hmm. the actual entertainment that may be on site in some of those rear parking lots, you know, the dinosaur thing or the Christmas thing or whatever they may be that people have mentioned in, in some of their, their letters. I'm sure you'll hear about them. So just to keep those in mind as well, if we're going to be using some of these newer lots in that same fashion about how we deal with that so that it's as comfortable as we can make it, not just for the patrons who come and want to enjoy the spectacle, but the neighbors who have to live with it as well. So did you have a cross-section or anything to show on the buffer that you're proposing? We do have one for yes. lot 42C. Yeah. What you see on the screen, let me just start off with, is not what we are proposing. What you see on the screen is um, one of the original layouts when we were first contemplating the project. You know, design is always an evolution. We don't always start with where we end. So this is where we started. Let's draw. Let's see what, what complies with zoning and what we can fit on the plan. This is what we started with. Let's take the, the, make the parking lot as big as we can. You can see it gets about 10 feet away from the property line. There's about a six, you can see the 16 foot measurement here. Um, this is where we started and where we are now and what's proposed in front of you is pulling that back 40 feet, providing this seven foot tall berm, which will be planted and fenced along the entire length of it. Um, and th this is what we're proposing. So that's, that's for which lot? Um, the special permit lot? 42C. No. That's 42C. What, what do but you I would say that this is as close as we get to the property line um, in that location. What about? 55. 55B. 55B is is darn close to the property line. It's closer, I think, than 42. Tracy, what area of, of that are you concerned with? We discussed on the, on the western edge, the southwestern edge, where there's a 10-foot cut there, so there's a natural there's a natural hillside. Mm -hmm. And the other piece of property is owned and operated by us. 
behind it. So right that here. property this right house. there where the mouse is? Correct. Correct. It's owned by you. Because it says, uh, we were looking at it earlier, we said it was an LLC and we didn't know what the school was. Okay. What, about, what about the one that's hmm. right above the fives? Go above the 55? 55. Go to 55B and then go up, please. Okay. Right there. What about where the 10 foot? The berm, the berm the vehicles right would be 10 feet lower than the berm, and then the house is off behind that through the woods. What about right next to it is a lot that actually spans Walpole into Fox Park. Sherman. Sherman's the name. We get about 13 feet away from that triangle. Okay, what about 44? The closest we get is 22 feet here to this property line, um, but there are no residential homes in the immediate vicinity of that pinch point. I'll let you. I'll let, I'll, I'll let you speak right in just a minute. Okay, you'll get a chance. I promise. Brittany, that process you had just described about um, modifying lot 42. Okay. After you went through that process, pulled it back, ballparking, you know, how many spaces did you lose? About 100, 100 spaces. But you still made your 3,000 figure, somehow, by reconfiguring other things. I guess the only point being is perhaps that type of flexibility could be incorporated elsewhere if deemed appropriate. Anybody else have anything? Are there wetlands um, to the left of 55B? Is that why you didn't go with like a wider? Correct. Okay. That it? Okay, so I'm going to open this up to what? You have something else? Open, no. open this up to members of the, uh, the, the audience who have uh, questions or comments, as I mentioned before. Just uh, come to the microphone, state your name and address uh, for the record. So, and, and we Kevin, just do you want to, just because of the number of people here, we, we kind of know the gist of what you're going to say. So, if there's a way yeah. to re reduce the redundancy, I mean, if you want to just raise your hand when you agree with the people, because like if yeah, every single we don't person gets up and says they're worried about the effect on their, you know, so we hear that, we get it. So, I think just from a streamlining, it's nine o'clock, this is going to be continued. Um, I think the board and, has and also <laughs> just so you know I mean we received letters from um, town officials and also private citizens please do not read your entire letter that some of them are very long and detailed and that's fine but you don't need to read the letter into the record I guarantee you that that will be entered into the record in its in its form as signed by whoever submitted it it'll be in the permanent record um, Hit your highlight reel, I guess, is what I would say, and tell us what the most important thing is, if you happen to be the author of one of these letters. And um, as, as Paige mentioned, if there are other people who are just going to stand up and agree with you. Um, feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to raise your hand instead of And just, just wave at us. Yes, so we'll know. And just for those who you may not know, when you come up, you do not um, speak directly to the applicant. You speak to the board, just to set expectations there. So who would like to start? Please, sir. Huh? Either, sir. Good evening. Good evening. I wonder if we could put the, um, the schematic up that has those colored lots, the purple and the green, just so that I can. And just your name and address, sir. My name is Bruce Norwell. I live at 19 Concord Drive in Walpole. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Okay. And just for a point of reference, I am not a direct butter to this, but I'm right across the street. So you could say I'm the next best thing, or maybe in this case, the next worst thing. Okay. Um, I guess primarily what I want to just suggest or really urge is to have you folks come out and take a look at this firsthand. I don't think you can really get a real handle on what the impact of this by looking at maps, by looking at 
uh, graphs like this or reading letters. I don't really think you can get it. I think if you were to come out and actually see where the stakes are that were put to demark the property lines between the proposed parking lot and what these lots are, they are literally right in people's backyards. They're going to be right overlooking people's pools, right overlooking their backyards, uh, right outside their back doors, right outside their windows. We have people in our neighborhood that have to stand as it is in their yards to monitor people, trespassers coming through the yards, cutting through these parking lots. I have one neighbor who they have a swing set in their backyard and they had this, they said that after a concert one night, at one o'clock in the morning, they had drunken concert goers out on their swing set in their backyard. If you were to move this all the way back from where it is now into uh, what is being proposed, you're eliminating probably 100 to 200 feet of woods, the earthen berm that was there, the fence that is there. I know they're talking about putting up a berm, but literally it's going to be right in people's yards. <clears throat> so I would, I really, I would urge you to uh, come out and take a look. Um, as it is now, we put up with a lot of stuff, with the noise, with the lights, with the Christmas lights that are there, with the monster trucks that are there in that lot. It's not just parking, passive parking. It's active events where there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of cars that pass through those parking lots during those events. And they're going to be, if they were talking about moving those even closer to our yards, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a hugely detrimental impact on our neighborhood. So um, I, don't think, I don't think we're being unreasonable. You know, if you're looking at this right here, this lot here, I want to just keep in mind, this is, this is um, flexibility is what they're talking about. This is not required parking. 3,000 parking spaces that really they don't need. They just need flexibility. I was also interested to hear council say that um, because it's a parking structure, it's a parking lot as opposed to a structure, there's no buffer requirement. So in theory, they could literally come right up to the property line. So we're talking about this space right here, maybe this space right here, although this is all woods here. This is a neighborhood right here. This is a neighborhood right here. Those are the areas that we're particularly concerned about. I think conceptually, you might not get a lot of pushback on these areas down here because they don't directly abut our area, our neighborhood. But those areas right at the top of the map that directly abut, uh, directly impact us, uh, we have considerable issues, and they've all been outlined in this letter that was submitted to you. So I won't go, I won't go through that whole thing, but I just wanted to express my concern and urge you to come out and, and take a look personally. I think it makes a big difference. Can I answer just a quick question uh, based on one thing you said? The, the, the pedestrians who you find entering from your neighborhood into or out of the lot, which way are they coming? Are they coming through yours to get to the lot or the, at the end of it's the both. Event? It's both. It's both. And you can tell who they are. Yeah. They all have the Patriot shirts on during game days. Yeah. During Country Fest, they're all wearing their cowboy hats and their boots and their denim vests. So you can tell who they are. And they park on our street and they kind of surreptitiously, you know, they're looking, you know, to try to sneak <laughs> through the lots, sneak yeah. through the yards. But we all know who they are. You mm -hmm. can tell. Can is is the there a fence there now? I'm sorry. Is there a fence? There is there? a fence. It's, again, between the, the, direct, the yards that directly abut, there's probably 100 to 200 feet of woods. Beyond that, there's a berm that rises probably 10 feet. And then on top of that, there's probably a, a six foot chain link fence. So and it works. They work Sorry. hard to get there. Oh, there are gates. There are a couple of gates in the lot, in the uh, fence. Um, so you, you said something that caught my, not I, my ear. 55 isn't of that concern. Cause I know that was the one several of us on the board were feeling angst about, but you said it does not abut any well, residential. Well, I know they made a big deal out of there being a buffer here, and that's true, but there's nothing over here. Over there, beyond, or I okay. should say maybe here, there's, there's a water tower back in there. But back in here, there's a street. Back in here, there's a street. So I'm sure the people who live on that street are as equally concerned as we are about okay. this okay. area I here. Was, I thought I heard you say 55 wasn't of concern. And I would like to come out. So maybe we can yeah. arrange it. And, you know, and it, it's interesting because I remember the last time we really kind of made a stink about the use of this parking lot was seven or eight years ago when the casino was being proposed. And I remember seeing a schematic, uh, a drawing, where they had the casino, the parking garage, the 30-story hotel tower that looked right down on our neighborhood. In the back behind the casino, it was just, it showed on the map, it was just woods, all right, as if we had been airbrushed out of the whole picture. And that's what I'm concerned is going to happen here, too, that we're just getting airbrushed out of this. All right, there's, there's a neighborhood back in here. 
There's the streets back in there. There's kids back in there. That's what we're worried just, about. Just one last question about you know the the, the pedestrian traffic and, <coughs> and and the parking on your streets. Are there any regulations in the town of Walpole to prevent that as well? There are no regulations that I'm aware of. There might be, but I'm not okay. aware of them offhand. There used to be a parking uh, detail. There used to be a police deal detail there that was paid for by the craft group. That seemed to disappear about 10 years ago or so. I know it was down on Schufeld and I believe on Comstock as well, uh, but they haven't been there in years. So. And there's no parking signs that say don't park? There are no parking during stadium event signs. I have one right smack on the telephone pole in front of my house, but it doesn't seem to be important. Well, it's got to be enforced, but also, I mean, I lived on Pine Acres Road in Foxborough, and we had them as well. And we were all very tempted to tow those cars, but you don't really want drunk Patriots players, can't play, fans, or any fans, not being able to find their car. Yeah, and it's not even being drunk. I mean, it's just walking back and forth through the yards, cutting through the yards. I mean, my friends, my neighbors across the street who it's directly about should not have to be standing on his ga in his yard on game day to make sure people don't cut through his no, yard. I completely agree. And if you move that lot 200 feet closer, because now if there's a screen at least, there's a screen of woods, but if you move that to, you eliminate that screen and put that lot right there, now it's in plain view. Now everybody everybody can see it. Why are there gates in that fencing? It's the fen historically, the fence has been cut by people to get through from the neighborhood into the parking lot. Is it your all's fence? Yes. There's about 6,000 feet of fence along the back of P10 and P11 that's put in. And after years of re mending and repairing. It's locked, but it's there for maintenance. They cut the lock, too. And, and we've learned to live with what goes on over there. We've learned to live with the planes flying overhead and all of those things, okay? Um, and, and listen, I think most of us are smart enough to know that, who knows, there might be some development in that lot at some point sometime in the future. It's its own commercial, so I'm sure, you know, there could be some proposal down the road. But it doesn't have to be right in our backyard. There's no reason why I can't see why there can't be some sort of buffer. 3,000 optional parking spots that are not even required. 3,000, and why can't we eliminate 500 of them to make sure that we have an appropriate buffer between that lot and our homes? Okay. Thank, Thank you for you. your if I could just make one clarifying point is that just to point out that the planning board is in, and the town is kind of in a tough position because we do feel for all you guys, but um, the zoning, like council mentioned, is written. I mean, this is a state designated, the EDA is a state designated high priority development area. This is one of the zones in the state that is being encouraged for development. So, and again, we have the S1 zoning and the EDA, so that in it's a it's a just an inherent conflict with the residential on that over the town line so that's this balancing act you know for the town of Foxborough this is something that behooves tax dollars and supporting the stadium but you know we do also at the board you know they're residents of a community as well and they understand sensitivity so it's hard because this is technically our primary zone if you talk to Foxborough residents they're like throw it up on route one you know but that's, yeah, that's to your detriment a couple of things a parking lot to me is not economic development mm -hmm. first my second question is you know minimizing the number of parking spaces here is you know to give them a bigger buffer might be a very neighborly thing to consider is it something that you folks would consider as we go through because we're not voting tonight I just want to go on the record here but we should have a sidewalk at some point, so. We, I think we should have a sidewalk, but I just want to know. Yeah, we should, and, and, and again, I think we've already shown that we've taken that into consideration from what we can do to what we have proposed. Okay, but I'm asking, can you, would you I do more? I think we can take it under review. Okay. Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, and I apologize for stepping out. I think the, the, um, the gentleman's, um, characterization of these as optional is, is, is really not a fair assessment from an operational standpoint. I think as Jeffrey and as, as Matt pointed out, um, and I can appreciate your concern about or comment about parking, but parking is critical here. Without adequate parking and without parking that's well managed, um, the viability of this operation is, is undermined. And so we've always looked um, into the future. 
and uh, planned ahead. And I think the idea here uh, in this central area, in the EDA, uh, to allow for parking with a reasonable buffer and the protections that we've always uh, kept in mind. And Dan and I were here before you 15 years ago when that um, initial acquisition was made. This was a portion of this was a junkyard. Uh, we've been before you uh, with the preliminary plans that the gentleman mentioned. There is a, there is a plan here for a, a large-scale office that was certified by the MEPA, um, the, the MEPA office in, in, in Boston. So um, this, this area is prime for development. Um, we appreciate the neighbors' concerns, and we are going to continue to work on an appropriate buffer plan and would welcome um, uh, feedback from the board and, and from uh, the stakeholders. But um, as we did 15 years ago, we will work with any interested stakeholders on an appropriate plan. But the idea that this is optional is not fair. Uh, it's, it's critical to the operation. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi. My name's Don Freiberger. I live at 20 Concord Drive in South Walpole. I live across the street from Bruce, who was up here a few minutes ago, only I am on the side. I'm a direct abutter. Mm -hmm. So from the best that I can tell, I am prob our residence is the closest to um, the proposed lot, at least in that direct area. I spent two hours last night writing a very long thing, which I will summarize for you. Thank you. Because Bruce already made a lot of important points. And please feel free <laughs> if you do want to send it in its entirety. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, oh, we have it? it yeah. Well, it's not the, there's a little bit more in here, but. Okay. but you uh, feel free to give us the hard copy. Okay, right in the office. okay. Well, it's not totally proofread, but that's okay. <laughs> um, we, won't, we, won't, we won't take a red pen, I promise. Okay. Um, you know, bottom line is I have lived in my house for over 30 years. And when we first moved into this area, um, it was not owned by Robert, that area was not owned by Robert Kraft. I believe it was owned by Rodman. It was heavily wooded. Over the course of the last, I don't know, 15 years or so, a lot of those woods have been taken down as the parking lot has come in. I don't have to tell you the, um, inconveniences that we suffer in South Walpole every day from stadium parking, um, from traffic, from noise, from, you know, we get all the inconvenience and quite frankly, zero of the benefit. Um, my house is about 200 feet. My, I have a pool. I'm, I was the picture that was up there a little while ago. That was my pool. My yard, my fence is 200 feet from the current fence where there is now a berm and the fence that separates the parking lot now. Even right now, that 200 foot area, it's, it's doable, but we still hear trash trucks, we hear partying, we hear swearing, we hear loud music. You know, the, when the monster trucks, I'm not talking about the drive through little monster trucks, I'm talking about the monster trucks the banging and the dumping of the dirt, it, it's, it's very, very, very loud. And as we have pointed out, these are not just eight home Patriots games. They're country fest. I know there's um, a hope that World Cup soccer could come there in a year or two. It's um, just any large venue. It's also all of the drive-through th things, the dinosaurs, the Christmas lights. Last year, there was a small road that was not really a road, but it feels like a road that was of trees taken down in between my fence and Robert Kraft's current fence um, with, to do test pits, to look at the feasibility of this project. With that, we have had an increase in the amount of sound from Route 1 that's been dramatic. You can hear the, the, all the you know, goings on in the parking lot that much more. Um, the view has been greatly altered and there's still a lot of trees there, but there's a lot less than there were. I have neighbors who now have a lovely view of porta potties out their backyard. 
And that is just not right. You know, you know, these homes are not inexpensive homes, not that any home is at this point. This is absolutely affecting our quality life and our property values. And this needs to be taken into consideration. Of just to bring up a few of the points from the safety standpoint, um, we did have a fire back in those woods. I don't know, it was maybe three or five summers ago. My husband and I happened to, it was sun, Sunday morning or Monday morning, whatever it was. It was after a game, so it must have been a Monday morning. We were sitting in our backyard in, and, you know, all of a sudden the Walpole Fire Department came charging through our yard and we're like, what the heck? And there was a fire, I don't know, maybe not even 50 feet from our yard. And we didn't, because of the way the wind was blowing, we didn't see it, we didn't smell it, we didn't hear it. And it was from a, a fire that was from the night before, from the game or concert, whatever it was. I don't remember exactly what the event was. You know, if that's moved closer, it is going to put our homes in jeopardy. We, have, we do not have fire hydrants in our neighborhood. We are all on wells. So there's no sewer or water hookup. And if, you know, who ended up actually putting out the fire was Foxborough because they came into the parking lot from the other side and put out the fire. But it was, it was a significant fire. And if that, it was very, very close to our homes. So I know that they say the police go and make sure all the fires are out, but you know, the wind's blowing the right way. It just takes one little spark to ignite a fire. So, um, I, I am very, very concerned about that. We are all on wells, as I just mentioned. We're worried about, my well in particular is about 10 feet from the fence, uh, my fence, so maybe 30 feet from the po proposed orange stakes, which are all on the other side of my fence where I assume the parking lot is gonna go. Um, you know, I, we're very concerned about our well water with plowing and salt and you know, trash and things that are, you know, pushed to the side um, when trying to clear a lot for a game. We, we are worried about that. I know there was some um, discussion about stormwater runoff. I was glad to hear that. I, I don't know a lot. That's not really in my, you know, wheelhouse to know much about, but that is a concern. I would be pretty unhappy if all of a sudden we had wet basements. Um, you know, I know that there has not been a MEPA report filed for this particular project. I did reach out to um, Gabby um, early last week and she said that there was potentially a proposal for that to happen. Um, we would insist that that be the case because, um, and I don't know a lot about these reports, but I know it's supposed to look at impact on environment, but it's also supposed to see if it's negatively affecting populations. Um, so this will absolutely negatively affect populations. Security is a huge, huge concern of ours. Um, I know that right now there is that berm in a fence. People, as you know, Bruce talked, people come through our yards all the time. And it is trespassing. And you know, like Bruce said, it's kind of like, you know, and they just kind of go kind of quick. The fence, you know, I beg to differ with what was presented, that the only reason that the gates went in there was because the fence was constantly being cut. I do believe there have been places where the fence has been cut, but there's always been gates. So it has always been an entryway for people to go through. Um, the closer that, that that fence and berm is to our yard, the more noticeable our neighborhood is going to be to all those people who you know, are parking in that parking lot. And it's just going to set up for more free parking in our neighborhood and for people to cut through our yards. The delayed exit parking, the delayed exit, yes, the delayed exit parking is an absolute worst case scenario for our neighborhood. You know, there is just, no way that could benefit us in any way. I, I thought it was a two hour exit delay, but you know, an hour and a half is still substantial. You're talking 1.30 in the morning. And you're absolutely right. People are going to be going back, building their bonfires, 
and doing all, you know, everything that they do, drinking. There will be some, I promise you, at some point there will be somebody in my pool. <laughs> I, I, you laugh, but I'm telling you, it, it is something we are really, really worried about. You know, we're going to have light pollution, we're going to have, you know, noise pollution. You know, right now the humming of the Christmas lights from the generators, we could hear inside of our house this year because just taking down the trees. So it is a significant issue. This is going to dramatically affect our quality of life, our sleep, which is, could affect our health long term. And it's, you know, it's going to have a very, very big impact on our property values. And I'm not sure that that shouldn't um, really be taken into consideration when we're looking at all the things that they're looking to supposedly make this better. Thank you. Thank you. If I may ask you a question, um, I would be just as upset people cut through my yard trespassing. Well, why wouldn't you think that would be a local police matter for the Walpole PD? People are trespassing in your property. They're parking on your street where it's posted. Yeah, so so it used to be a Walpole police officer that sat outside my house. And I, I do not know the whole history of that. I, I fully um, you know, say I don't know exactly what the contract or arrangement was. But Kraft did pay for that the Walpole to, for yeah. that police detail yeah, during case. that time. That expired somewhere along the lines. And it, when that expired, it did increase foot traffic. But moving this back is going to increase it tenfold. No doubt about it. Dan, do you know why the um, police officer stopped being there? I think we're actually still paying for it. It's just a matter of manpower. My, my understanding from Jim Johnson, who is um, the town administrator for Walpole is that um, you do provide some police um, money, for lack of a better term, um, but it is not sufficient for all the detail that is needed in the town of Walpole. Thank you. Okay. Your letter oh. was very well written, by the way. Oh, thank you. I had help. Um, I do have a petition that many people signed if you're interested in having that. You can present it, that's fine. Yep. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Hello, my name is Andrew Bourne and I live on 36 Cobbledale Drive right next to the woods that you are planning to tear down. Hotel. Thank you. Tearing down the woods is a terrible idea, and here's why. It will make lots of people very sad, including me. Me, my dad, my dogs love the woodlands behind our house. Very, it's very calm and relaxing, and it's full of gorgeous plants and animals. And it's a home to many birds, deer, coyotes, and even foxes. Taking it all away would be very sad for all of us, and it will remove the homes of wildlife. It will kick out many animals. Since there are no longer any large forests or woodland dwelling animals, they'll have to move into the yards and nearby houses, potentially leading to disruption. It will also put, push bad animals into yards. With more people coming near what used to be woods, it will attract many disease transmitting bugs like mosquitoes and ticks. And with the loss of forest, will drive pests out of the woods and into homes like mice, termites, raccoons, and cockroaches. It will be very noisy any time there's a game with the, reduction, with the reduction of trees to absorb sound. It will be far, far louder for anyone in the neighborhood since some of the borders are less than a foot from some fences, forcing them to hear all the loud noises of the stadium at night. Strangers will come into people's property. Once all the trees are cut down, it will reveal the houses behind them to potential vandals and thieves that never used to be such a big problem in the past. The extra space that is created will barely be used. Even when there's like the biggest game of the year, a huge chunk of land will still, still be fairly empty and unused. So what's the point in making that useless spot even larger? If you are going to tear down a large part of woods, you better do it for a good reason. And this is not a good reason that will have no later benefit. 
And if you do cut down all the trees, these are the animals that you are taking away the homes from. Thank you. You did a good job. Thank you. You did a great job. How you doing? Uh, my name is Patrick DeShanes. I'm the director for community and economic development for the town of Walpole. Uh, I know earlier this week, Jim Johnson, town administrator, sent a letter in. I won't go over that in, ver uh, in verbatim, but just a few of the points already stressed tonight. Um, you know, it's, it, it's a very considerable change for a lot of the neighbors that live in that neighborhood. Um, the reduction in privacy is, is substantial. And certainly within your zoning bylaws, it looks like there's a, um, the waiver of the rear yard setback within the S1 district, I believe, where it was. Uh, as uh, Ms. Duncan had mentioned earlier, a site plan review, that's one location that it would be great to look into, especially for the neighbors and the concerns of while that setback complies with your zoning, looking into providing a proper adequate buffer for those neighbors and um, in, in ensuring that that is something that is preserved and, and looked into to be um, sufficient for, uh, for noise reduction, for privacy reduction. Those are things that a lot of these neighbors have, uh, have been putting up with and have been dealing with, with, with game day traffic, with event traffic. And so those are some of the concerns that I know Jim had mentioned and, and then certainly as, as the town are, are concerned about for our residents. Uh, in addition to that, one of the um, big points is the water watershed, uh, the ARP, the uh, geez, water resource protection overlay district. Thank you. Uh, is, is encompasses many of the lot, a few of the lots in that location. So our drinking water is is, is supplied in that area. So looking into the stormwater um, uh, management plan, and so. Just a brief overview. It looks like it was a fairly adequate plan um, overall, but we are interested in taking a look at that peer, peer review letter and and following up and seeing how um, what the response was to that. So, very good. Thank yep. you for your time. Yep. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we go back 20 plus years. Uh, same with Mr. Kranz. When we first start, when you first started the, state, the state your name and address for or John Murta, uh, Nottingham Way. Now, it's cr the craft people tell tell us it's critical to the stadium operations to have this, but we have a lovely, quiet neighbourhood with small kids, and 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 uh, you have to take that into consideration. And I would ask the board to. Um, to uh, meet up with Bruce and the people up there and, and, and just just look down at those houses and see how close they are to the to the to the boundary you know and um, I, I don't hear any uh, landscape architect involved in this process you know um, you have to create a buffer here and it has to be uh, I guess pines or whatever. You know, you can't leave this area bare naked. And uh, I, 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 I would back, uh, would echo what Bruce said. Cut down on the parking area and create a buffer between the, these beautiful homes and young families that's living up there. And I, I know this board will do the right thing and I know Dan Krantz is, I, 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 Dan, you, you did Pretty good in Nottingham Way and, 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 and the first parking lot. Do the same again. These are good people. And uh, um, uh, what let's see. Um, yeah, a landscape architect and get the right, uh, uh, you know, the right type of pines in there that you'll block the, you know, the, the noise. We put up with a lot of noise over there. P10. Every noisy event. You shove it over on top of us, right into our neighbourhoods. And we, we haven't complained, uh, Mr Chairman. We, we put up with it. But now I'll ask the board to act this time. And uh, 
Um, yeah, a problem with the, with the star and water, because we have a sole aquifer pretty close, so we don't want our water contaminated. So we have to be very careful with the, with the runoff. And uh, um, we're removing trees, is that correct? And vegetation, uh, when we're enlarging these uh, parking lots, we're, are we cutting down trees? That is correct. Uh, how much, uh, how many <coughs> trees, a, a big area of trees? I believe it's still on the plans, yes. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not, I, I, didn't get a, I didn't get a plan, but uh, uh, th that's a problem, you know, because you're, when you cut down trees, uh, when you remove ventilation, vegetation and trees, you create a, 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 a no matter what you say about storm water, you have more water created. You know, you have, an, um, you have that uh, tree roots to absorb the, the moisture. So that's the thing we have to look at. Um, uh, so um, I, 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 I conclude, I won't, I won't bore you tonight, Mr. Chairman, but I, I've always found this board smart, receptive, and uh, a very accommodating to me. And uh, I, would, I, would, I would definitely want a, a landscape design plan and well. the parking lot pushed back from the, from the, from the property <coughs> line and, 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 and uh, um, a good uh, uh, um, dose of pines, trees, to, you know, to, to separate the, the neighborhood from the, the, you know, the parking lot. We so I, uh, I thank you for listening, Mr. Chairman. Good to see you again after all those years. Good to see you too. <laughs> thank you. Good evening. My name is Jim O'Neill. I live in Free Fox on Trail in Walpole. I'm a member of the select board in Walpole, and I'm also a town meeting member. So I get to engage with the community on a frequent basis, as you do. And uh, I have talked to a number of these fine folks out here tonight, and you can see there's quite a number here. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a lot of concern on this. And I'm not going to go into those concerns. I think people have expressed them very well tonight. And of course, you have the big long letters that you have gotten, one from our town administrator, Jim Johnson, which I reviewed before it came here. So I had input to that letter. I would just ask you to read those letters very carefully and consider them. Because I think there is some real potential for harm here. We've got good people living in good neighborhoods who are disadvantaged by the fact that we've got the stadium right nearby. It's a fact of life, but something that Bruce Norwell said they've learned to deal with. But that's changing. And the decision to cut down these trees and push these, these uh, parking lots closer to the, the lot lines and create what I think are, I think you called them pretty good buffers that's what I wrote down anyway. I don't think they're very good at all. And I want to talk about that in a minute. But I would really ask you to think hard about those things that you've heard tonight and things that you've seen in the letters as you make your decision on how to go forward with this project. So with that said, I have a couple questions. I wonder if we could put the uh, picture back up that shows the buffer zones. Can you do that? Thank you. So you talked about the buffer zones and you pointed to them with your pointer. But what you didn't talk about and uh, what Mr. Murtaugh just hit on was what's being taken out. So could someone please talk about what's being taken out and where? Where are the existing tree lines and how, how much tree, how many trees are being removed? Could someone address that? I would say the, the existing tree line is, is in close proximity to the existing lots. Um, I would say that this, this buffer here bet behind 42C, one of the things that we did not emphasize previously is the buffer requires an increase in the limit of work to provide the seven foot tall berm. Um, there is the option to not provide the berm and save some more of the existing trees. Um, it, 
and unfortunately, it, it's sort of a give and take to to provide the, the grade separation. In, in all of the other locations, there is a naturalized grade separation, um, whereas behind 42C, there, there's not. So the intent is, unfortunately, to expand the limit of work a bit um, to get the, the berm to, that will separate these lots from the abutting neighborhood. Um, and we are proposing white pines be planted on the entirety of that berm on both sides. Can, can you show us on this slide up here where the tree line is today? Sure. Why don't I um, pull up the existing <coughs> I'd like to get a sense for just how many trees are going to be cut down here, how much current buffer is going to be removed. <coughs> I'm just going to pull up the site plans and it'll show the um, the tree line. Okay. We do need to look at these at a, on a lot by lot basis in order to see the tree line. Um, so for this lot, for 42C, ex for example, you can see the squiggly line here is your limit of existing tree line, and then where we're proposing it. And so what, can, can you talk in terms of the, the acreage or square footage in that area? Mr. Chairman, do you want us to respond? May. I'm sorry, can you, what was your question? Brittany, he'd like to know the approximate square footage or distance of the area that would be clear. Or acreage. Thank you. Yeah. This is also something that could be asked to be de provided after this I meeting. Agree. We're going to be continuing. We're going to go through every lot and right, calculate right. a calculation. But it, I, it, it, it might be something sure that we respond. ask uh, to have them, rather than Brittany guessing, yeah. you know. On I'd be happy to, to provide it. You know, that might be something that perhaps possible. for the yeah. next meeting to keep we could have an actual on. accounting, a so better information. I think it's important, and you can provide it afterwards, but it, to the board, this is a very important part of your decision, is just how much of this land we're going to allow to be cleared. And it, it matters for all the reasons that you've heard tonight from the people who have stood at this podium ahead of me. And I don't need to repeat those, but there's a lot of trees that are going to be taken down here. And these lots are going to move right up to the lot lines, as you've heard said. Well, not right up, but we, we, we get your point. Yeah, about me to you, okay? That's how close some of them are going to be. So right up to the lot lines in my mind. So I would really ask you to think hard about what we're being asked you're being asked to decide here. Now when I go back to some of the other things that I heard, so we talk about the voice of the fans, we talk about improving the fan experience, we talk about the ability to flex, we talk about the game experience. The game experience for these people is not great. This won't improve the game experience for them. It may improve the game experience for the people that are parking in the lots, but it won't improve the game experience for these folks. And it isn't going to make their lives any better. And I'd ask you to really consider that. Paige, I think you used the word common courtesy earlier. I think that's the right way to think about this. Someone said being good neighbors. I think you need to be good neighbors here. I think common courtesy is something that needs to be factored into this decision. And the voice of the fans out there really needs to be thought about. One last thing. <clears throat> we talk about matter of right. Just because it's a matter of right doesn't make it right. My father always used to tell me, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. <laughs> so I'd ask you to think about My that. My dad used to say the same thing. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. One more. going to bring it home. <laughs> no pressure. Good evening. Um, my name is Karen Nelligan and I live at 8 Comstock Way. 
in Walpole. If you could please put up that other slide that showed 55B, because I think there was some mention about, well, 55B, and I think actually you corrected that uh, it is very close and we are behind that area, so I just wanted okay. to point that, that out. That would be great, thank you. And while she's trying to find that slide, um, one other recommendation, I thought that was a good one about maybe for the next meeting, having um, the amount of trees, or the, the number of trees or that may be coming down. What also might help the board is some satellite images. Because from this, it's very hard to tell. It's hard to tell for myself. You know, I live probably about right here. There's wet, there are wetlands in my backyard. Um, but if you, the board would get, first of all, going there and seeing it in person would be extremely helpful, but also a satellite image so that you can really see the trees, not just, you know, kind of colored in with green pencil, and also the proximity to the houses would be very helpful. Um, so my question is with 55B, is currently that space right now, and I don't need numbers, but just a yes or no, is 55B all trees and woods right now? Primarily, yes. Yes. Okay. So the second question is, um, and none of that area is wetlands? Because I know in my backyard it's designated wetlands. To the left. They cannot disturb it if it's wetlands. So, and it's hard, again, with these maps, it's hard to see. And I know Walpole, I think um, Gabby had helped me out. Um, Walpole had supplied um, a little bit of a map with some of the homes. And that's where I, why I can tell that I'm in this area. I think. Um, so it would just be more helpful for clarification for people, too, um, because I don't know, even from this, exactly how close that extends to, you know, to my property. I know I have some buffer because of the wetlands, but for the people, I think it's Cobble Knoll, maybe, who are closer. Okay. So it might be helpful for them, just so that kind of everybody's on the same page and it's more more clear for everybody to make decisions it's a good request uh, would be what I would ask next time thank you. thank you yeah I think that I think number of trees acreage is in some information I want and I I would like to do a site visit I, I, I would absolutely like to do a site walk as well yep. just to get a better feel for it so we all understand Happy to do so. good evening just, just Come, come now, please go ahead. I just, just for point of clarification, the entire property was delineated for wetlands, so markers are still out there. And this will be the last person. And can I just build off that? The buff, the 100 foot buffer zones off of that delineation are shown on the site plans. Great. Good evening. My name is Tara Spellman. Um, excuse me. I live at 21 Freedom Trail in Norfolk. I about Cobble Knoll. Um, I am the point in the map where the three towns meet. So earlier someone said, oh, there's not a house back there. There is a house back there. It's um, yours. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I just did a walk the other day because I had been back to the property any number of times, but I hadn't been back there for a while. Um, I have a question about the lot 44. If you could put that slide up. So lot 44 right now is a retention basin. Right. It is for the runoff of all the lots for lot 42 and all of that side. So how is the stormwater mitigation going to happen if you're graveling over a retention lot? Correct. Would you like me to? Please, please respond. That's an existing basin, and the stormwater design accounts for removal of that basin and replacement with new basins. Okay. That is factored into the design. Brittany, if I may, is that the yes. new basin shown to the there, left There's left? actually two. There's, um, so you can see the existing basin she's referring to, mm -hmm. and there, there's a, a new basin here and a new basin here. So there, there's two new basins to replace the one. So is the, the current, this new basin, there's an existing basin there now. It's trees. It, it's it's, it's not a basin. Tree. It's not it, a basin, it, but it, it's trees. Correct. So there'll be tree removal there. Correct. They'll be graveling over the existing lot, like bringing it up to grade, or what's what's the design of of that parking lot? Would the board like me to respond? 
there will be earth work that will level out that area so that we can put a gravel lot and then there are basins that are designed downstream from that lot to collect the stormwater and treat it in accordance with the rules and regulations. So will that, will the, the new lot be at the level of the existing lot so that they're looking over into my house? Or is it the, down the, a little bit lower? The proposed lot will be at approximately the same elevation as the top of the basin. Okay. And the plan, as I can see, has, has a six foot fence with no berm around it? Along that lot, correct. Okay. Um, we, there was a lot of talk about being good neighbors and being considerate. Let me just tell you, the, the plan to pull traffic onto a net road and down to Lincoln, it's an industrial park. Mm -hmm. It is bordered by houses that stay very close to that road. Um, that roadway hasn't been used. Or actually, it has been used for the last, it was used the last few games of the season last year to open up the back gate to alleviate some of that traffic. So it's putting traffic, it's putting idling cars, it's putting noise, it's putting trash. It's, it's impacting the neighborhood. Um, um, one of my questions is why are you using a net road and not the currently built access road that goes right out to Route 1 to the lights out there? Then you're not dealing with any of the traffic on Lincoln. You're not dealing with any of the pedestrians on Lincoln. There's an existing road that's been there since these lots were built that is not being used. So the road, if I'm understanding your question correctly, it's the gravel path that comes down near the P9 traffic signal on the west side. Is that the one that ent enters at Opposite like Bass, Bass Pro? Pro Drive? Yep. Yes. So that road, we, we did look at uh, possibly using that road. The biggest reason for not using that in this capacity is, is again, pedestrians. So th that's really no different than Lincoln Road. And the geometry is such right there that we obviously don't own the, the uh, property immediately adjacent to it. That's a, a separate commercial parking lot. And to make the geometry work through there and not impact the setup and the operation on Route 1 as, as it relates to the traffic management and the lane uh, channelization, it just it doesn't set up well to be used for an egress point from that location. And as I believe as Jeff, you know, Jeff can speak to it further, but to his earlier point, the more we can introduce traffic downstream from the front door, as I always call it, of the stadium, the better off we are. And, you know, to, to the, as a point of clarification on Annette Road, um, Annette Road, uh, up until recently, had commercially licensed parking lots on it. Metropac was a commercially licensed parking lot along there. So it's not like that road has not been used for event parking in the past. It, it would, <coughs> I would imagine the number of cars that were at Metropac were less than 100. Uh, as opposed to 3,000 or 1,300 that they're talking about. Um, as everybody else has said, game day, and it's not just the eight games anymore, it's concerts, it's Magic of Lights, it's Hot Wheels, it's listening to the dinosaurs from Jurassic Quest. Um, it's impacted us, and we all have the schedule of, of Patriots games in our car, so we know that we can't move around the neighborhood and that we can't cross Route 1. And we, we, I'm a proud Patriots fan. I, you know, I tell people I live in the shadow of the stadium. But it is an impact. We have had people in our yard walking through. I can smell what everybody is cooking in their tailgate in 52, or not even in 42, because they didn't always feel that. I can hear the noise. I can hear the tailgaters. They start for it. They start before four hours a game. They're there well after the games. Um, they are definitely tailgating after games. They are not leaving when they're not. I'm um, horrified at some of the behavior of people. I'm, I'm shocked that there's not more arrests for DW, DWIs. But um, it, it's an impact. I'm concerned about the greater impact. Um, as someone else has said, we're all on well water up there. We have no town water. We will not get town water. If our water is compromised, we're out of luck. 
The stormwater mitigation is huge. In addition to the retention basin at the Walpole Stadium, there's a retention basin behind Cobble Knoll. That sits right next to my property. That has filled up and overflowed. And um, I can't imagine clearing more trees is gonna help that situation. We are all sitting a little bit downhill. Um, we've been before this board before too. There is a series of natural swales that pull the water through our neighborhood and out down to lower ways and down to Route 1. It's part of the protection of our neighborhood and that can't be disturbed. So otherwise you're gonna flood us all out. I would ask the board to be good neighbors. I, I would also suggest if you wanna to come to my house and stand by the post, happy to take you out there, happy to take you up that way. Okay. Um, you can see the impact it's gonna have and we're very concerned. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I could just clarify, because I have been referenced a couple times, and I do believe, you know, I did say that about the neighbors, and, but that's where the being a good neighbor and being considerate. But I also mentioned that we have our prime economic development area here. So that's our conflict. So hearing something like a net road not being used, I mean, that's in our industrial district. That's an industrial park. So that doesn't necessarily, like, I don't want my words to go so far that it thinks that at the detriment of Foxborough and their economic development goals um, that, you know, the good neighbor goes so far. And I would also challenge Walpole, I don't know where the selectman is, but, um, you know, you might need to get some Walpole police involved. Um, you know, I mean, I understand you don't need to address. I'm just saying, like, Walpole has their own things and I get it but so there's just a balancing act there I mean obviously we're trying to be sensitive but again this is our industrial zone so I just want to make we're it gonna, clear we're gonna ask just we're gonna stop it right now so thank you I think this has been a lively discussion we never have this many people come out for our meetings <laughs> um, make a motion to continue make a motion to continue the public hearing till March 24th at 7.45. March 24th. Do you guys, is that enough time to respond to all the requests and get them in early? Okay. We like to schedule a site So a new notice will not be sent, um, and you can check the website if there's any continuance or call, but otherwise it will be just at 7.45 in two weeks. There will not be a new notice sent out. I'll second that motion. All those in favor? All those in favor? Aye. 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 We would like to schedule a site walk. So get, Diana will have to post it. So we'll need enough time to do that. When do we want to do it? Saturday when it's raining. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's snowing. Snow. You need a 48 hour notice. So the so when can we, 48 work. business? Um, yeah. Um, so when can, what, I only, when? I, it, you only need to post it if a majority of you go. If you guys go in ones and twos. Are you, you gonna go all go. together? Yeah, well, I don't know. Flexibly. Probably easier, but I mean, like let's just go. Tweet. Yeah, let's go all together. Can you guys help us coordinate? Yeah. Thank you. You could do like a doodle poll or something or whatever. I like doodles. Make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll second it. <laughs> wow. Kevin, we don't need you. <laughs> oh wow! Oh, Paige, Paige and I, Paige and I, are both going to leave. You know, we're <laughs> going permanent vacation. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Thank you for your uh, Thank information. You. Thank you for your time. You're welcome.